Transportation Advisory Board to the Metropolitan Council. It is uh, Wednesday, April 17, 2024, 12.07 p.m. And uh, as I say, calling the meeting to order and uh, looking for a motion on the agenda. So moved, Anderson. Second, go tell. We got a motion and a second on approval of the agenda as published. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the agenda as published, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. We have an agenda. Um, now we've got uh, the public portion of the meeting, and uh, we don't usually have a guest, but we have a former TAB member here with us, Bill Goins, who was our freight rep uh, before George, uh, pre shember we'll say. <laughs> and uh, unlike uh, George, he never rode his bike across America that I know of. But uh, Bill, come on up. You've got something you want to talk to us about, I think, re related to the uh, unique projects recommendations and your thoughts on how we might think about this in the future, so. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, I appreciate it. And it is great to be back in chamber. It's been uh, pre-pandemic since the last time I was in this facility, so. But it's amazing, it's great to see so many faces. But I know I've got three minutes, and I'll keep it even under that. Uh, just here to talk a little bit about this subject that uh, we all know as unique projects. And uh, one of the things that I think we even wrestled with years back when, when I was on the tab was the real development of the scoring on unique projects. And, and I am here representing uh, a project that was submitted, Global Wellness submitted on commerce mobility. Uh, real quick, we established uh, a set of forums, International Commerce Mobility Forums, uh, started last year. We have done six, five of those. Six is coming up in April or in June with the intent of bringing public, private, academic, nonprofit, and consulting strategic thought leaders from this area together to work on how can we improve transportation and supply chain options? How can we look at things that we aren't doing today? And we started with a simple question having to do with international freight, upper deck, wide body freight that's being trucked to and from Chicago. Why are we doing that? Couldn't we be flying our own wide bodies in here? From that question, and over the last year, we've been working with the Metropolitan Airport Commission and others, and we now have a study commissioned involving consultants to find out how much international freight is being trucked every night to and from Chicago. We know some of our major international shippers, like Abbott, they run about 75 pallets a night via truck to from Chicago. So that's one piece, or I'd like to call it peeling back the layers of the onion. We want to understand even further what does that trucking activity do to the environment. And from an equity standpoint, we're learning just through preliminary data that there's an equity component. Where are our truck yards? Where are our rail yards? Where are trucks idling? It's not in the Edinas. It's not in the Plymouths. It's not in the Wyzettas. It's not in areas where maybe a little bit more affluency. It's where those that uh, are, are, are struggling. And so we've got an environmental concern that we want to study. And therefore, we came to the Met Council with a proposal under unique projects uh, to try to study this. And what we've learned certainly is the waiting on the projects is certainly towards those things you'd call traditional infrastructure projects versus strategically looking out. How can we really study things that we can either, you know, uh, wait until they're upon us and kind of forced by public media, et cetera, to, to deal with these kind of issues, or we can be proactive through doing a feasibility study and see are there improvements we could make. And certainly the other study that was in the same category was high-speed mobility, the connectivity of not only Rochester to the Twin Cities, our hub, the heart of Minnesota, but should we be studying high-speed mobility to Duluth, should we be studying high-speed mobility to St. Cloud? Today we do run a train halfway there. Should we be studying that further? So I mention all that because the background is that, you know, the way the scoring components are laid out 
it's pretty difficult, particularly to get over the significant category, which is almost half of the total points. And so it really does put feasibility studies at a very distinct disadvantage. I want to watch my time. So bottom line here is through what we're trying to do through global wellness connections, what we're trying to do through the International Commerce Mobility Forums, we would like to formally work with the Met Council's tab in how can we together maybe improve the scoring components for the next round. So I'm not here to, to throw stones at, you know, the two studies didn't make the cut, and you'll hear more about that, I know, on the agenda. But how can we certainly work together so we can be strategic, we can be proactive, rather than allowing these things just to happen? Mr. Chair, thank you for yeah, the time. Thank you for being here. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. Thank Thanks, Bill. Anyone else that wishes to address the tab on a matter of concern to them? All right. Let's move on into the report section of the uh, agenda. And uh, we had a, an exec committee meeting just preceding our meeting here today and uh, did discuss a bit uh, this uh, very issue that uh, Bill Goins just brought up. And, um, and I think uh, later on in the meeting, you'll hear uh, some of the folks that were on that unique project scoring team from our, uh, some of our colleagues uh, about the, the challenges you have when you've got a unique projects category designed to evaluate projects as opposed to evaluating the value of a study. We're just not set up to score them very well. And you'll hear them talk about that. And possibly that's a change that we would need to be thinking about for the next uh, solicitation, if we think these uh, the potential for doing studies is important for us to be engaged in uh, as a region. So um, I won't go further than that. We went through the agenda items. Uh, I'll go now down to the other agency reports. Um, we have uh, nobody here from MnDOT today, uh, but just a heads up, thanks to our Commissioner Gattel. It is National Work Zone Awareness Week, so consider that to be the report out by MnDOT, that it's National Work, for, work Zone Awareness Week. Uh, then I'll turn to uh, Frank Kolash, who's here, a member Kolash, is here from the MPCA, may have something to report out for us as well. Member Kolash? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Frank Kolash, <clears throat> excuse me, use he, him pronouns, uh, Assistant Commissioner for Air and Climate Policy at the Pollution Control Agency. My primary update right now is that the uh, Pollution Control Agency is working with six port authorities and eight private companies uh, to develop a grant application for the Inflation Reduction Act's Clean Grants Program, which is an electrification opportunity focused on port operations throughout the state. It's, uh, there is $2 billion available throughout the country, so we're going to be working with various port authorities to look to replace diesel engines with electrification for various operations, uh, including cranes, solar power, uh, some of the ground operations that they have those vehicles as, as well. So we're looking to ap apply for that at the end of May 2024. And we did submit our uh, just around $600 million uh, between the PCA and MnDOT also had a small application in there as well for the Inflation Reductions Act Clean Pollution Reduction Grants, implementation grants. Those closed on April 1st. We intend to hope to hear from EPA on awards for that in July of this year. Yeah, very good. That prompt any questions for Member Kohash? All right. I, I was thinking about one uh, related to the, the expansion of uh, EVs as a method for f folks to move around. And, you know, you've worked on a plan to have chargers in different locations in the state. And, and I was wondering if you, you know, you think about fast charging at level three. Uh, is there any kind of a plan to to put those chargers in significant numbers in each of the rest stops across the state over time? Or what, what's the strategy there to relieve people's anxiety about, uh, you know, am I going to get from A to B without having to sit somewhere for an hour and a half waiting to charge my car? Yeah. Uh, yeah thank you, Mr. Chair. And on, on that point, there, there's two opportunities for electric vehicle infrastructure funding. The specific question you're asking about electric vehicle charging at rest stops. Um, that is something that MnDOT is working on. I understand that there, as I, I don't recall if it's a state law or a federal law about putting in that kind of charging at a rest stop uh, because of 
earlier times when they were concerned about competitiveness of putting gas stations at rest stops, and that includes the electric vehicle charging. But MnDOT would have more specific information about putting that in. And, and then from the pollution control agency standpoint, we are committing the full 15% that's allowed under the Volkswagen settlement to continue to develop out EV infrastructure in the state. Uh, we're looking at corridors to make sure that we're getting, trying to get to, there's 50 miles between fast chargers on the corridors. And I think that that's also a, another I, item for MnDOT, as well as they have the national vehicle infrastructure, the NEVI charging infrastructure plan that they put together to, uh, uh, to be eligible for, I think, $64 million of federal funding. And that's been in for more than a year now. So I think they're just waiting for funding for that uh, to hear clearly what the, when the funding's going to come through and then moving that forward. But uh, MnDOT would be better to answer the question specifically on rest stops. I just know that there are uh, prior impediments to doing that and MnDOT has to work that out with fed, federal government or with state law to make sure we can do that. All right, very good. Thanks for that. Did that prompt any other thoughts or questions you want to ask? Members? Okay. Uh, Carl Crimmins is out today. Uh, can't give a Mac report. He's home ill. So we'll mm. excuse him from a report this time around. And then uh, Deb Barber, our Mac Council rep, is ready to make a report as well. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just one thing to report on today. Um, as many of you remember, as part of the federal IIJA, the region began receiving a new federal formula allocation for carbon reduction activities. These funds come to the council as the MPO and are not covered under the current agreement regarding how council, TAB, and MnDOT distribute funds. Um, this uh, uh, bunch of money, the carbon reduction funds, total about $7 million annually. In the 2022 solicitation, the council directed that TAB should allocate the carbon funds for 2023, 24, and 25, and that totaled almost $24 million. This funding went to 14 additional active transportation projects and allowed the funds to be allocated quickly and to get the projects underway. Since then, the council has formed a new climate action work group of five council members, of which I am one of those members, to discuss how various regional climate activities can be supported by the council's programs and policies. <coughs> the work group discussed the carbon reduction funds this past winter, their purposes and potential uses. The work group and council are interested in assuring that the funds go to activities that can best address greenhouse gas reduction, but also recognize the need to get the 2026 and 2027 funding allocated so that projects can get underway. For 2026 and 2027, the council again recommends including the carbon funding in the 2024 solicitation and emphasize that it be added to and considered separately from the other regional funds so that we can clearly demonstrate that the funds were allocated to climate reduction projects such as active transportation, transit, and TDM and traffic management. The 2026 and 2027 um, funding totals about $16 million. For funding in 2028 and on, the council asks that the carbon reduction funding be considered as part of the overall regional solicitation evaluation and that a specific process that emphasizes greenhouse ga gas reduction be designed to allocate those funds. As many of you know, we are embarking on, on the next session of looking at and evaluating the regional solicitation going forward, which is why we wanted to um, bring some of this information um, and relay it from the um, uh, climate work group at the council now. Uh, so, because um, specifically, um, the council um, asked that the solicitation evaluation work group and TAB consider how projects such as electric vehicle infrastructure projects that are not currently eligible as a unique project can be brought into the solicitation. I'm confident while many discussions during the evaluation process to determine how best to use these funds and also that the 16 million in 2026 and 2027 funds will be well used as part of the 2024 solicitation. Good. Thank you, Member Barber. Questions for Member Barber based on that report? All right. Thank you. Uh, next up, our, our colleague Gary Hansen is going to report on suburban transit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Suburban Transit Association Board uh, appointed uh, Burnsville City Council Member and MBTA Board Chair Dan Keeley to be the STA alternate on TAB. You may recall that I, re I followed him as, as, the, as the TAB uh, rep from, from STA. Mm -hmm. Uh, that vacancy occurred when uh, Kevin Burkhardt became uh, a Metro Cities uh, TAB representative. So the musical chairs continue, uh, but uh, I, I 
assured Dan that I would try to keep his job easy by being here. So he, he agreed to do that. Um, more good news, the suburban providers report that uh, MVEST receipts, the motor vehicle sales tax receipts, are uh, as expected or slightly higher, which is good for operating revenue. And uh, also ridership uh, overall continues to increase, led by uh, micro transit uh, ride on demand. Uh, for example, MVTA's fixed route ridership is up 16% over a year ago, and the, uh, the Connect micro transit ridership is up 24%. That's my report. All right, good. Questions for Member Hansen? Based on that report? Yes. Um, I just want to do a shout out. I had bought a desk at an auction because I needed a new desk at home, and want to shout out the uh, frugality of MVTA because I ran into a number of their employees also picking up furniture at this auction for their offices. So uh, it was cool to run into them and uh, cool to see that we have some frugal government spending happening. Uh, thank, <laughs> thank you, you for Chairman. acknowledging that. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, nice to get a shout out if you're in government. <laughs> um, we've added something to the, uh, uh, to the uh, reports and uh, our colleague, Commissioner Julie Jepson, uh, is gonna report out on some work she's doing with the Advisory Council for Traffic Safety. Commissioner. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the time and, and members for possibly adding me um, as often as I can for um, information and updates regarding um, ACTS, the Advisory Council for Traffic Safety. Um, so I, I don't know if I need to provide some background because this is very new. The governor just signed it into creation in 2023. Um, so do you want me to just a brief so. description? That'd be, that'd be helpful. Okay. Um, so yes, it was established in 2023 um, with six specific goals to advise the governor and Minnesota commissioners of public safety, transportation, and health on policies, programs, and services affecting the traffic safety, advise the appropriate state departments on towards zero death program activities, encourage state agencies to conduct research in the field of traffic safety, review all grants dealing with traffic safety and state and local traffic safety plans, review recommendations of the council subcommittees and working groups, and make recommendations on the safe road zone measures under House File 2887. There's a little over 30 representatives repre represented, represented, thank you, on the, um, as, as members, as voting members, um, my seat is based on the Association of Minnesota Counties. As a county commissioner, I'm representing the state's counties, uh, League of Minnesota Cities, uh, Police and Sheriff's Associations, um, Trucking Association, City and County Engineers, um, Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota, Driver and Traffic Safety Education Associations, and many, many more. So it's very widely, broadly represented by all the, um, all the entities that are impacted by traffic safety, or the lack thereof. Uh, so one of, the, one of why I wanted to present today is there, there's a product that we created um, through the Minnesota IT Services, or MINUT, um, to create a publicly accessible real-time interactive app called the Road Safety Information Center, which um, you can see on the screen is one of the screenshots, and I know there were handouts created, so you can see those there. I just wanted to highlight the uniqueness um, but also the duplication that this app has. There's currently an app format like this for um, MnDOT and local community engineers and planners that they will continue to use, which is called the Minnesota Crash Mapping Analysis Tool. But this is very specifically focused for the public to also use, which will be really great for all of us um, who don't have access to the other app. Um, it, the one thing to point out is this does not include bike or ped crashes. These are all auto crashes with a vehicle some way or another. Um, there is the 2023, November 2023, bike ped study that was finalized. And if anyone needs a link to that uh, report, I'm happy to share that. Uh, the Office of Traffic Safety is in the process of identifying other data sets to integrate into the platform, uh, such as MDS, EMS, courts, et cetera. Um, additional data sets uh, depends on the location, format of the data, as well as resources to allow. So how this information is currently harvested is through Waze and Google, um, and it's uploaded daily um, in 15-minute increments. So it's very real-time, very specific. Um, as you can see, I re um, this data on the screen right now is um, from January 1st 
uh, of 2024 to 4.10 of 24, I requested this information on 4.11. So this is very, very real time. Um, as you can see on the map, this is all crash severity levels throughout the entire state for those few months. And then as you can see on the lower right hand corner, you can choose by city, county, zip code. There's a number of different functions that you can specifically request, including the severity of the crash. And so the yellow and the red are the dots you don't want to see, um, but those are absolutely dots you have to see in order to make future decisions. Uh, here specifically for, the, for that time frame is the seven county metro. And then here are all crashes in 2023 for the state. Again, severe, serious injury and fatal, and the seven county metro. So a pretty interesting um, graphic to look at, and hopefully we can make some good decisions based on this real-time data for funding purposes, design purposes, and, and such. Um, but this, this platform, this app, won't be public until about next month. So um, more information to come as more work needs to be done. A couple more things. Um, the Council's safety action plan work is tentatively scheduled for a presentation for TAB. Um, at its June meeting. Uh, part of the work in this project includes analyzing mapped crash data and other roadway data to identify high injury streets um, in the region where there are concentrations of fatal and serious inju injury crashes, as well as more proactive analysis to look at where there is higher risk of these severe crashes, not just where the crashes are happening, which is great. And finally, I want to remind everyone that the applications for the Safe Road Zones funding are due on May 3rd. But if any portion of the project is located within the MPO boundaries, such as Met Council, letter of support uh, priority is needed. So that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, thanks, Commissioner. Uh, prompt questions from members? Commissioner, you, you provided a lot of data today on the on the where, and have you started to look in depth at the why and uh, how to reduce the, the you know some develop some strategies or at least preliminarily around uh, crash reduction? That takes a lot more in depth analysis and research, but it's definitely being worked on. Okay, all right, good. Well, we'll look forward to future reports and and. Uh, I'm sure you'll have some notions from this uh, advisory council about how to go about a reduction strategy. So, hope so. That's Thank your you. purpose. All right, um, Chair Hager, anything that you wanted to report out on before we get into? some of the things that you'll be covering? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick update for the board. Uh, there was one action item that was on tax agenda this month that is not represented on TAB's agenda. So at the request of the FHWA, TAC has postponed an action item to set greenhouse gas reduction targets for the MPO. Uh, we're, le we're waiting to learn more from the FHWA. I do expect that item to come back later this year. Okay, all right, very good, thank you. Uh, minutes uh, of uh, March 20, 2024. Are there any changes or additions, or is there a motion to approve? Move approval, Anderson. Second, is there a second? Second, Jenkins. Thank you, Mr. Member Jenkins. We've got a motion and a second to approve the minutes of March 20, 2024. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the minutes of March 2024, say aye. 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 Carried. The minutes are approved. Um, and now we'll bring Chair Hager back up to uh, go through the, both the consent and the non-consent uh, business items on our agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we'll start with 2024-18, which is a streamlined TIP amendment to the 2024 to 2027 TIP to increase the cost of two projects that are already represented in the TIP. The first is an increase in the cost for a reconstruction of Dakota County State Aid Highway 32 and to also change that project sponsor from the city of Invergrove Heights to Dakota County. The cost increase is about $8.4 million. It will be covered by local funds. The project is funded with surface transportation block grant funds and is not funded through the regional solicitation. The second is to increase the cost of a project that MnDOT has to repair five bridges along I-94. The cost increase is about $3.2 million and this project is also not funded through the regional solicitation. TAC recommends approval of the streamlined TIP amendment. All right, questions for Chair Hager on this matter? Uh, Commissioner Holberg, you want to move the matter? Certainly, thank you, Matt, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Commissioner Holberg moves, is there a second? Second. All right, Hanson. Member, Member Hanson seconds. 
Uh, the adoption of 2024-18. Any further discussion? All those in favor of uh, adoption of the, of the motion as recommended, say aye. 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 Carried. 2024-18 is adopted. Thank you. Uh, and then on to the, uh, the non-consent business uh, items, and that is 2024-16 and 17. 2024-16 first, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 2024-16 is a scope change request for Hennepin County's CASA 52, which is Nicollet Avenue, and CASA 66, which is Golden Valley Road, HSIP project. The county is proposing to remove one intersection from the scope of their project because those improvements at Nicollet and 67th Street will be completed instead with another county project to reconstruct Nicollet Avenue. The county is requesting this change in scope with no reduction in federal funds. TAC recommends approving as such. This follows um, what we've been doing over the last year or so with these types of scope changes where the improvements are going to be accomplished with a coordinated project. Question for Chair Hager on, on uh, 2416. All right, Commissioner Gattel. I'd like to move it, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Is there a second? A second. All right, Mayor seconds. 2024-16, uh, uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of 2024-16 is recommended, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And then uh, next in line is 2024-17, uh, and that's in alignment with a larger project, I think. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. 2024-17 is a program year extension request. Uh, MnDOT is requesting a program year extension to go from 2025 to 2026 and align its US-8 intersection improvements project with a larger reconstruction project along US-8. The request is for a project that is in Chisago County, which is outside of the MPO's planning area. However, HSIP is administered by MnDOT and Chisago County is within MnDOT's metro district. Additionally, the larger project of US-8 touches the MPO planning area and both projects are currently represented in the TIP. Therefore, the action does need to come before this body. TAC unanimously recommends approving the program year extension to move the US-8 intersection improvement project from fiscal year 2025 to fiscal year 2026. All right, good. Thank you for that succinct explanation. Any questions for Chair Hager on this matter? Uh, yes, Commissioner. Mr. Chair, I'll move. Make Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bingham moves. Second. Is there a second? Commissioner Gattel seconds the adoption of 2024-17 in its recommended form. All right. Any further questions? All those in favor of adopting 2024-17 as recommended, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. 2024-17 is adopted as recommended. And now we are on, we started early for a reason, because we've got a quite a few things to cover from an informational standpoint. So thanks for coming in early today. Uh, and we're going to start out with the uh, regional solicitation updates. And you see that there's uh, five items in that uh, category, those sub-items. And we'll bring Steve Peterson up here to lead us off on that policymaker work group uh, scheduled for the 25th. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a, a quick one, and we'll spend more time on some of the others. But uh, we do have a policymaker work group uh, set up, which is primarily TAB executive and uh, others who have volunteered um, Mr. Chair, you've agreed to be the, the chair of uh, yet another committee, so I appreciate that. With um, Council Member uh, Barbara will be the vice chair of that because we do have uh, four council members as well as um, ten members on that. So the first meeting of that will be a virtual meeting, April 25th, 1 to 3 p.m. So since it is virtual, if there's others that want to join and uh, listen in, you can. And then at that meeting, we'll decide if we want to uh, continue on the virtual or if, or if some of these conversations are, are best had in person. So I'll uh, be thinking about that too. So that's the first item. Uh, number two, I'm going to turn it over to Member Johnson here to give you an update on active transportation. All right, good. So last time we were all together, we talked a little bit about the work group's initial conversation, which was we wanted to spend some money in the 2024 regional solicitation. We had to work out the details. So that's what we did in our last meeting. So for the active transportation piece of this, we wanted to note that there were 
a very large number of projects that came through in the regional solicitation, uh, 65. Um, you can look ahead and you can see the items in yellow that are under the baseline funding. It's a very short list for some of those categories. So if there's a possibility of spending some of the money that's come in from the sales tax revenue, that was a priority of this group. Uh, we did want to make sure that we were being selective in the projects though. So we had a few different details about how much in total money we wanted to spend out of what's accumulated so far. So we estimated estimate about $28 million will have come in uh, by the time that we're kind of through the regional solicitation period. Uh, we're recommending 15 million of that be spent, and I'll show that in the next slide for some of the, the details to it uh, for specifics. But we also wanted to put in some small projects for this. So there are some uh, active transportation projects in the bike and trail programs that are higher than two million, but we did settle on $2 million for a limit uh, for the projects on this to keep them small. Uh, we also prioritized earlier projects. So one thing that uh, we did not know when we came into the work group was that during the regional solicitation, applicants are asked if they could move this program forward. They could do the project in an earlier program year. And so since we had that information, um, we will of course confirm with applicants they can actually follow through with 2025 or 2026, but we felt that that was something that we could also pursue. We could say, if you can do this project earlier, we would like to have this money be spent earlier on these projects. So we were able to do that as well. And then really the final piece about eligibility was we wanted to make sure that the high ranking projects were being funded. So. As you look through this, you'll see in yellow, we have the baseline funding. So if anything, this would maybe be, instead of federally funded, maybe the number one in a category would be funded with active transportation dollars because it meets the other requirements. All that really would do is just push the funding down one or two more projects. So it would just slot in where we have eligibility, but we wouldn't be skipping down to the bottom of a category or anything like that. It would just be supplementing additional $15 million uh, across the categories. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. But the last thing that we did talk about in our meetings, but certainly mentioned uh, last <coughs> month, was that something that we did not know last year was that in the regional solicitation for these types of projects, because they're federal, MnDOT was managing the grants. And so this year, when we were investigating it, staff uh, brought this to our attention that Met Council has to actually manage the grants for the active transportation sales tax dollars because they're state level. So that's a really important detail. And so we're treating this as a pilot project because yes, we're adding additional money into the regional solicitation. It also gives us a possibility of learning from the Met Council side of how to actually run these grants. So that was a really important consideration and really drove some of the other decisions we made about this. So expect there to be a lot of learning going on uh, of this and definitely something that I, I don't want to speak for uh, staff on this, but I'm sure if there were major concerns, it would be brought back to TAB to discuss, here are some things we want to think about uh, for next time around. And certainly, uh, as Steve mentioned, for the 2026 uh, policymaker work group about what are the big changes coming, because it's a possibility this money will be included in that, that process. So the last part here is we did want to make sure that we were preserving the regional solicitation project requirements because we're really putting this money uh, in with this same mix. So the biggest thing there is, is that we want to make sure there's still a local match. We didn't want to remove that and make it so it feels unfair to applicants who came in uh, with an understanding of how they were going to be funding things. So for this, we are going to keep, uh, again, um, eligibility for project costs, program year, scope chain process. So we just saw some of those scope change and extension requests from before. We're following those same uh, processes for this as well. So specifically, we were tasked with recommending to TAB what we're going to do. So I won't repeat all these details, but I will highlight all the things that we approved as a recommendation and then really talk about the next steps to this. So our recommendation is to spend up to $15 million, as mentioned, uh, for the regional solicitation in 2024. We also included that at least one project should be selected from each of the three active transportation categories. So multi-use trails, pedestrians, and safe routes to schools. Uh, we want to make sure we were doing the small projects as said, so $2 million or less, and we want to do those early project years 2025-2026. Uh, and as long as they can meet the additional legislative requirements. So I didn't put up this slide here, but I do want to note that there were two additional, uh, out of there were seven total requirements for the sales tax dollars and how they would need to be spent. One of them, of course, is it needs to be in a regionally competitive uh, solicitation process. Uh, but a couple of the other ones were about equity. Uh, and so we don't necessarily have all the information to that. Um, so we wanted to just follow up with applicants to make sure that we were getting that. Um, really just explaining how they meet that requirement. And then there's also a second one about being part of a uh, regional system. And so we talked about, could that be the, the uh, uh, 
regional trail bike network, some of the other categories there like comp plans. So we're really looking for uh, getting back that information from applicants to see what did they say when they were explaining how they met those requirements, something that this work group's gonna continue to work on in the next couple meetings. Uh, as I said before, making sure the highest uh, scoring regional solicitation applications are gonna be funded, um, not necessarily just from our funding source, but making sure that we're supplementing this and we're not jumping down the list. We wanna make sure we just stated that up front. So high scoring is still really important to our way of doing this. Uh, and then, uh, again, that local match part still have to have 20% or higher uh, for the local match on all of these. And I do wanna note that this was a, uh, a recommendation voted on uh, by everyone in that group. It was, there was no, nobody who was voting against it. And I think that was just a testament to the really robust discussion talking through all these pieces. And I just wanna call that out. I do wanna thank uh, members Jepson and Holberg who have been very vocal in a very good way about here's some considerations uh, that you wanna take into account. Here are things to keep in mind and also just here's something you shouldn't worry about and that was a very valuable perspective coming in as well so thank you to to both of you for that and of course to my vice chair uh, martinson uh, for again just we have a lot of meetings so i appreciate the attention uh, behind the scenes so the next steps on this is that this is a recommendation to tab so you'll see today that none of this money is included in any of the baseline funding because it's not baseline that's only the federal money that's come through from our, our existing sources so staff is going to be working uh, behind the scenes now to be generating this with some of our scenarios it is money that's going to be shown i'm guessing probably in a different color because that's what we did it in 2022 so be nice color blocks of this is where the funding sources are uh, including it sounds like the carbon reduction funds so it's going to be if you're around for 2022 probably more complex looking but it's also a good thing we have some additional funding sources to cover some more projects so that seems like a, a very important thing um, Again, I don't wanna go through all the bullet points here, but I just wanna note uh, the last bullet point in the top there that this will move through the full tab TAC process. So just as all the other pieces are being put into place for the funding scenarios, this is gonna flow through that process and come back to us uh, for updates monthly here uh, going forward. And then the last part is that we have a lot of extra work to do on the work group that's about what do we do for all the other money coming through in perpetuity going forward every year. Uh, we initially are going to have conversation about should we do a special one-off solicitation for 2025. That is going to be, a spoiler for anyone on that work group, is going to be our conversation topic for next week to start talking about that. And then yeah. part of that policymaker work group is we need to give guidance back to that group of what should we do long-term for how to set up these funds. How should they be spent? What are considerations? Um, so far, I would say we've been relatively conservative and the changes we've made to how these are going to be spent, but the dollars are very different than what we get from the feds. So it's a really important thing for us to consider what's different, what's special about these, what are some things that they can do that none of the federal dollars could is a potential thing to discuss. So we have a lot on our plate, uh, a lot to get, in, get going on this. Um, I will note that the 2025 solicitation, I mean, if we decided that we're gonna recommend to do that and we come back to tab, our timeline's still very tight because applications probably need to be done by end of this year. So it's certainly possible I'll be talking to you literally every month about what's going on from the work group, assuming we try to move forward with the 2025 solicitation, but I'll certainly give an update if we decide not to, and instead look at 2026. So I will leave it there and open it to questions. Thank you, Member Johnson, excellent report. Um, it, it strikes me that uh, you know, I see the requested action is, uh, and we don't have it as an action item on our agenda today, but you're looking for general consensus, which would, would, would tell you, well, or do we really need a motion? But it, it seems to me that, can you go back a slide to your uh, recommendations? It, it strikes me that uh, for the benefit of staff that's working on this, it might be better to have it in the form of a motion. And I was thinking as you were going through your presentation that if the tab were so inclined, it could agree to adopt the recommendations of the working group and direct staff to include uh, active transportation funding and the overall funding scenarios for TAB's future consideration, which would be consistent with what you had on slide five. So, I, you know, thoughts on that from, from colleagues, from members about that approach? I'm gonna, I don't think you can actually have a vote as an we have information item. item. You can. It's not. No, you have to okay. Say, you have to All right. Yeah. I forgot it was an information item. Yeah. Okay. So you can get a recommendation. So, so uh, yeah, well, let's take that then to, uh, you know, are people comfortable with that kind of a general recommendation that the- uh, looking for. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Commissioner. Yeah, and I, I missed the last meeting, but I think this is really reflective of a lot of good work and discussion and kudos to the co-chairs and the 
staff. I think the one point that's missing if we're gonna take a formal is that there should be a geographic uh, distribution as well in the funds. The funds are being collected across the entire yeah, so you, county you, metro area and it's not, we, we kind of try and do that, but if we're looking at voting on a list of criteria, that's an important one is, that should be okay. considered as well. The same thing we do with the regional solicitation, put that geographic lens on it to look at balance mm -hmm. as a final sort of step. Okay. Okay. Um, are, are members comfortable with that sort of an approach? Other, other comments from folks? I see a lot of affirmative head nodding from a lot of bright people in the room. So, uh, so I think staff then, I think you've got the general consensus from the tab that uh, we're recommending that the, uh, uh, the recommendations of the working group be uh, followed with the addition of the uh, geographic balance lines being added to that, uh, that list. Uh, and that staff be directed to include uh, active transportation funding in the overall funding scenarios for TAB's future consideration, understanding that any active transportation <coughs> funding will be voted on separately from any federal funding. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Thank you, yeah, that was some terrific work yeah, done great. by all of you, thanks. All right, that's, um, <coughs> and thanks for the protocol of advice. I forgot we were in the information. All right, um, let's move on now to Member Martinson who's gonna talk about this uh, unique projects scoring uh, that went on and this may be interesting to Mr. Goins and his colleagues that are here and you can hear about the effort that this, uh, this team went through as they wrestled with both projects and, and studies. Member Martinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I apologize for my, uh, my voice today. I came back from Ohio after witnessing the totality of the eclipse with a, with a cold to come home with. I've tested multiple times for COVID. I do not have COVID, but I thought a mask was prudent to prevent sharing my cold with the rest of you. So on to the business. Um, so, so I've been asked to report on the work that the Unique Projects uh, work group put together in looking at six applications that came in that got put into that category. Um, before we took to them, the staff had reviewed those pre-application letters of interest with both the FHWA, MnDOT, and MPCA uh, to address any federal eligibility issues. And they met with each of the applicants prior to the December 15th application deadline to share their feedback with the applicants. And those six projects then uh, came forward based on that review. Um, we did deem after that review that one of the applications, number 20491, was in fact non-responsive to feedback in that pre-application phase. They were given the opportunity to make changes to their application based on input and feedback that came from FHWA about the fact that there were several ineligible elements in their application. They did not uh, amend that application to take those elements out. And so the committee deemed that application just simply non-responsive and we did not score it going forward. The other five applications did go forward um, and I'll talk about those momentarily. The committee had on it a good representation. We had uh, two county members, two citizen members. We had one, uh, sorry, one city member, one modal member and then tab alternates who participated in the conversations but whose scores were not included in the final scoring um, the final scoring assessment. So we met several times and in that process, we, we went into this with a scoring uh, regimen that we had determined we had created last time around or after the last unique projects round. And then we met first and, uh, and kind of discussed how we were gonna implement that scoring process because having a process is different than implementing it. So we, we did that and then we all stepped back, we all provided our independent scores and then we came back together as a group and then reviewed those scores again and said, okay, we had some questions, people had uncertainties about how they should apply the criteria and here are the, here are the main uh, five categories of criteria that we were being asked to assess. Each of these criteria had several submeasures to it. And, but those were significance, environmental impacts, racial equity, multimodal communities and partnerships. And then those were weighted based on an agreed upon weighting that, that TAB had decided um, in this past, I forget exactly when we decided it, but at some point before we did our work. 
Um, the scoring process that we were using had a potential of 900 points total. And um, after we met the first time with our preliminary scores, got everyone's questions answered about how we should be implementing and thinking about these, everybody was asked to go back and revisit their scores, come back with revised scores in the second round, which everyone did. Everyone did their homework. Everyone behaved very well in this work group, I have to say. And, um, and then we had very good agreement about where scores uh, landed after that. That resulted in very clear-cut um, decisions about the funding, which you see here. These are our recommendations on this slide. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So you'll see on the top in those green squares, those are the criteria that we were assessing against. And then the scores are in that red column to the right there. And you can see, we tried to come up with a, an, a t an endpoint score that was, it, some, it looked similar to how the scoring works on all the other categories that we address in the regional solicitation. So there was a, a potential of 900 points as opposed to either 1,000 or 1,100, which the other categories get. But nonetheless, there was a very clear uh, cutoff point in the scoring gradient as it went down. The top three projects uh, very clearly scoring within fundable range. And then the bottom two projects not scoring um, in a fundable range based on what the committee decided. So um, those three projects that were eligible for funding, um, we, had, we were asked to figure out how to allocate 4.5 million in this process. And out of that, we have to take the travel behavior inventory, sometimes called the TBI, as a set aside for about one and a quarter million as an absolutely essential and unique data source that gets used for all kinds of things and is irreplaceable, has to be done. Uh, so we just take that money right off the top. And then if we fund the top three project scores, that brings us within $8,000 of the funding that we had to work with, which we, we kind of, we, we liked that it was that close. We thought that was very nice. And so our recommendation to TAB is that um, we fund those top three projects, um, perhaps less the 8,000 that was requested, um, or maybe we take some of the money from, that we use from overfunding and, um, or overprogramming and, and add that 8,000 in to, to bring it up to par. That's something we can discuss. So the process, while we felt it led to a clear set of recommendations here, um, and we felt that it was a pretty good process. We definitely thought there were things that we would wanna revisit if unique projects are to be carried forward in the next round of the regional solicitation. Um, so here are, here are kind of the high level bullet points of the things that we think warrant further discussion and um, deliberation here on TAB before we do this round again. So we think that applicants should be asked to identify how their projects will directly address the scoring criteria and that they may also be asked to talk about how indirect effects may also be considered secondarily. Um, this, this is an important point because if you look at the measures that we were asked applicants to respond to, they were all about direct immediate effects. And if you're doing a feasibility study or a study of some other sort, um, you're not gonna have any direct effects. You're at best gonna have indirect effects. And I don't think that was as clear to applicants and it caused the reviewers some consternation as well in terms of how we should have dealt with that. So we feel that needs to get clarified in the next round. Um, we recommend an earlier identification and elimination of non-responsive applications such that we can avoid people on all aspects of this avoiding unnecessary work. We, um, we, we determine whether studies should be eligible and if so, how to integrate them into the scoring process. I'm sorry, that bullet point. Uh, I, I, I've just lost my thought as to what that has to do with. I think that's related to the point above. Um, we also need to, we wanna codify what we decided to do in this process, right? So we had a scoring system going in, but we wanna have it clarified and codified how we implement that scoring process and, and, and document that for future use. And the other thing, the final point, we, we felt that this committee uh, might have benefited from having a chair appointed uh, at the outset. Um, we discussed having a chair appointed at the second meeting and, and I said, well, I think we only have one more meeting. So I, I don't think this is the point at which we should appoint a chair. <laughs> However, it would have been definitely helpful if we'd had a chair from the outset. So we're making that recommendation as well. And I think that's what I got for you. Thank you, excellent. Uh, questions for Member Martinson? 
Yes, Commissioner. Just, uh, some comments and then just a, a, a quick ask. I just want to say that I really support this and the work that you've done in the four and a half million. Um, you know, it, it really took a lot of work to get through these applicants and to make these big decisions. And you know, that I don't. I think that's pretty good that you came in around eight thousand yeah. dollars. I think that that speaks pretty much volumes. Um, I think this is good to have this way you utilize this scoring and what you're doing and to codify it would be really helpful for us. And so I'd encourage to move forward and for TAB to uh, adopt some of that so that it goes smooth in the, in the, begin, in the next phase. Um, I'm also, but I'm interested in just if anybody in the group talked about the cost effectiveness of any of these projects. Was that brought up underlying any of those categories that you worked on? Um, that, the cost effectiveness, no, um, applicants were not asked to address the cost effectiveness of their projects. Uh, and that is not included. I, I, have the, I have the overall criteria before me, but I don't have the 25 measures that, that are sub to those. Okay. But I don't believe any of those measures addressed cost effectiveness mm. or cost benefit. Okay, interesting. They, uh, but that is a point, right? So mm -hmm. if we're going back to ask people about how they're going to respond to the measures, I think the measures are also up for revisitation. So we okay. can decide if we need to add measures or if some of these measures might be taken away. We, we can also discuss this, the weighting of these measures. Okay. Right? All right. So the changes we made last time around were to refocus on significance as opposed to innovation. All right. That's something that I don't want to get into the weeds on here, but we've gotten into the weeds elsewhere. On okay. and, but so other changes are certainly possible for the next round. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I could make yes, a comment. I, I was on this group and... I might say it just a, a little differently. Um, direct impact, that was a key concept. And the term project, you know, what constitutes a project is also a key idea. And I would say if this group wanted us to fund studies, we probably should have a category called unique studies because we really focused on projects that would do something that would have a direct impact as opposed to something that, you know, 10 years from down from the road from now, you know, may have an impact or, you know, if a study, you know, if the, like the Hyperloop, um, you know. So if, if this group wanted uh, us to fund studies, we better have a category called unique studies, probably, or at least clarify what you, what you want us to do. Yeah, good thought. Others, any thoughts on this, this good work that was done? Commissioner, any? No, it was a very in the weeds committee though. Okay. It was, it, I mean, I had never done it before and reading all the applications and I mean, I was very dissatisfied last time around. So I decided to get, you know, get my hands in the dirt and get in there and try it. And it, uh, it was a challenging thing. And I think a lot of these will, will help. And I, I just think the realm of possibilities is very wide with the new funding source and redoing the federal regional solicitation in the same time frame, it will give us opportunities. We may want to use sales tax money for some of this type of stuff too, if it's more immediate. And um, so I think we've got lots of options to discuss in the next year in setting up the next round. Yeah. Thanks for that. Member Martinson, I don't know if you want to comment at all on the comment you made at the exec committee about the um, the quality of the of the the lead um, <laughs> organization. I mean, the, the you know what we're what you're looking for, what you think would be a, a good model to follow in the future for folks that might be applying in this category or any category. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. Uh, since you've offered it, I'll take it. Uh, so let me let me be transparent. So the the application to which the chair is referring is the application for the EV car share program that came from the city of St. Paul. Yes. I have to reveal I'm a planning commissioner at the city of St. Paul and also a St. Paul resident, therefore. So, so maybe you argue I have a bias. However, <laughs> I, when I, so, and I looked at these applications as someone who's spent my entire professional career both writing and, and reviewing grant applications for the federal government for National Institutes of Health Funding. And I looked at the application that came in. This was for the EV car share program to uh, push it out to the east side in St. Paul. And that application absolutely was one of the best applications I've ever read. I've ever read. It was it was well done. 
Every point that they wanted to make, they backed up with citations and references. They addressed every measure that they were asked to speak to, and they both, if, if they didn't have a strong answer for it, they said, this is a weakness of what we're doing. But they brought data based on the prior uh, EV car share usage that they, that they had documented. And so I looked at this and I said, this is actually a model. This is a model application. If everybody put in these kind of quality applications, our job would be so much easier. So if we're allowed to use it that way going forward, that was, that was my recommendation, is that it's a, it's a model application. So thank, thank you, you for that. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think we'll have Elaine or someone check with them to see if, well, I guess under the rules, is it, is it, is it public data? Yep. It's yes, public it's on the yeah, website, think so. yeah. Mm -hmm. no. I think it would be just courteous just to ask their permission if we to, sure. to hold it up as a model. Member Clash. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Following up on that point, I'm, I'm, I'm curious you brought that up. It's something that we're facing as we look at we're granting out state or federal dollars for other places, and that's bringing up and, and, and having other organizations that don't have that same capacity to be able to learn what makes a good or a great application, and if there are any plans to be able to take this, not just make it public, but <clears throat> develop a process so that other organizations can learn about this and they can make their uh, their applications in the future, particularly for these innovative type of projects where we're hoping to get new uh, entries into this, new organizations involved, but being more proactive about uh, giving them the information about what makes a good application, what makes a great application, and some examples of what those look like. Yeah, good thought. Chair, thank can you I, for that. Can yes. I, so thank you for that, um, Mr. Colash. I, I think that's a, great, that's a great observation and a great point. And in fact, uh, we have on the Active Transportation Committee talked some about the potential that those dollars could be used in some ways. So recall that the active transportation money that comes from the regional sales tax, we get a small percentage of it here. Each of the counties gets like 17% of it that they've got to spend roughly half of it on active transportation work. But it seems that it's possible that those dollars could be used to stand up some kind of a program that might be oriented towards helping perhaps um, municipalities that don't have all that capacity to, to stand up some of that capacity to learn what some of that process would be uh, that, that can help them apply successfully for, for grants here at TAB. So. Never Bradley. Never Bradley. Um, I was also on the Regional Solicitation Evaluation Committee, and I think one opportunity for improvement came when um, around the equity conversation, and I know that there's some groups, like um, I'm a part of the Transportation Equity Policy Group, and they're coming out with a tool in the future, and I think that that will greatly help some of the applicants be able to describe um, kind of like the equity piece of the evaluation that we have to do because some of them were kind of like all over the place or the way that they described it didn't really describe the equity of their area. Um, so I definitely think that in the future that's a place of improvement is the equity part. Yes, thanks for that, Member Bradley. Um, this has caused me to think about, um, I was at a climate conference sponsored by the Aspen Institute and I rode down on the plane with a woman from the Margaret Cargill Foundation and what they're doing is they're helping small cities in greater Minnesota be able to apply for environmental grants under the IRA because people in the smaller cities don't have the capacity <coughs> to be able to complete those applications. So I thought it was really a kind of a magnificent decision on their part to expend the monies to help cities across greater Minnesota uh, with, uh, with those grant applications under the IRA. So in, in fact, now, we're having a conversation with her about some of the smaller communities in the metro area as to whether or not Margaret Cargill Foundation will be willing to assist them because not everybody has a sustainability coordinator uh, at the county or the city level that can help work on these grant applications. So you, you're on to something really interesting here, I think. Well, well, Member Anderson. You know, going back to my mayor days, it's expensive to apply for anything. And if you've got to pay your city engineer or if you have to outsource uh, a lot of those technical aspects of, or... or uh, uh, you know some of the things that we're talking about. It's it, it, it you're you're putting a lot out there without the promise of getting anything back, and, and a lot of cities don't have that budget capacity to do those things as well. So that's those are great ideas. Here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's give that put that on the list of requiring further thought. 
Got it. Um, anything else, Member Martinson or members of the committee? Yes, Member Kolesh. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up on your yeah. issue, we're talking about that as well at the climate sub cabinet level, at the state agency level, and uh, with the governor's advisory council on climate change. Understanding uh, to, to Member Anderson's point, there are cities that are well positioned to make great applications for federal funding or for state funding. Then there are cities that have no capacity to be able to meet even the state requirements, and we need to be able to fill that gap. We're also working with the University of Minnesota Extension Service on how to provide that as well. So if, if that is some a great interest of the, of the organization, I, I think we could join that in with the Metropolitan Council as part of our the climate sub-cabinet to identify ways to continue to provide better services and better assistance so that more Minnesotans have access to these funds that are, are uh, you know, generational and they're, they're uh, amounts and, and impacts on Minnesotans. So. Hey, yeah, good thought. In fact, I was thinking as you were speaking, I should uh, connect you with this person from the Margaret Cargill Foundation I've been talking to, because I think they've also been working with the university. So you've got some uh, common ground there. We'll try to explore that a little bit more. Yes, Commissioner. Yeah, thank you. You know, one of the things that every time this comes up, thank you for all this work, and I really like that we're putting how do we score it, you know, into future so that it's clear. I think the other piece that's missing is to be clear on what we're looking for when we say unique projects, because that still remains a mystery, which is why we get such a scattershot of, of projects. But if, if this body could say, we are specifically looking for a project that reduces carbon by X, Y, and Z to meet our goals, or we're looking for a project that meets equitable action for transit. We, we need some clarity on what it is we're looking for when we say unique projects, and that's gonna help these submissions, and I know certainly our counties and our cities that are applying. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. Member Martinson, I think one other thing that you should report out on for the tab is, uh, what we hope to see from this uh, data that gets gathered both with the St. Paul EV car share program and then the one that's being expanded in Washington County. I think, I think the so, tab members would be really interested in that. Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. So <clears throat> I think that, um, uh, that speaks to the question of the, the, the move that we made to try to, to, to speak to Member Martinson's, the, the other Member Martinson's <laughs> point. Um, that when we started this, the last round, it was all focused on innovation. And a, as a, innovation is a problematic term in, in any number of ways. And so I, I, I think I, I, I spoke up loudly at tab exec and I think you maybe, you threw it my way to give me a shut up maybe, but I didn't shut up. So I, you said, go ahead and, and come back with a scoring process. So I did, and I, but I, in doing that, I also said, let's move away from the word innovation towards um, Im impact and um, significance, and or other. Well, well, there's there's another as well, but 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 I think the point being, you, you want we wanted to look at projects that had impact that were significant in some way, or some ways, and so the EV. So someone raised in in, in exact the question of well, is is EV car share on the east side of St. Paul really you know is that is that really significant? Haven't they already done that? And it's like, well, no, they haven't. So what, what EV's done is they've implemented car share, electric car share in certain parts of, in certain parts of the city. They've had good success there. They've been collecting data on that success. They've had levels of utilization of those cars that surpassed their expectations. And, but it's a different question to say, can you get McAllister students to use EV cars than it is to move an EV car share program to the east side of St. Paul where you have higher levels of disadvantage higher levels of households who don't own cars and who are more transit dependent and who have maybe different transportation needs. And to understand, does EV work in that context as well or in different ways? And then in addition to that, one of the other projects that we're recommending funding for is expansion of EV even further out into Washington County, into the suburbs in connection with a, you know, sort of a, a, a ride share and with the gold line BRT and that's answering questions that, that will, or it should have the potential to address questions about the effectiveness of EV car share systems in those kind of suburban settings. The reason that's important and why that's significant regionally is if we want to spread EVs throughout the region, and we do, 
then you, you don't necessarily want to spread the peanut butter just all even across the bread, right? It may be that these things will work more effectively in some places and settings than others. And these kinds of projects are going to help us to understand if we collect the data and then we look at those data, it'll help us to understand where these EVs can be most effectively deployed on the front edge. And that's why I think these projects are significant. So thanks for the opportunity to address that point. For sure. Thank you, and thank you, um, Member Martinson, for your work on this. One thing I will add is, and you're going to hear me say this later on, too, um, transit looks different in the suburbs. And so having unique projects like this to address um, the, the East Metro area where you're looking at the gold line where there are a lot of zero-car uh, household, one-car households, um, to be able to address um, a population um, that that we are trying to to help with equity and also um, the college um, that you mentioned the college population too um, that you know you have Metro State you have Century College you have a lot of just unique if you will uh, opportunities there um, in this transit need so um, it's appreciative that you know we were awarded this project but I do think. Um, to what Commissioner Martinson said as well, um, we are um, trying to focus in on, on hitting these goals that the, the committee had. So we appreciate that. And I, and I think the discussion here has been really good today to try to award programs that meet all of those goals. Yeah. Yeah. Elaine's telling me to move on. All right. <laughs> Pass it to Elaine. Who's? Elaine. Oh, maybe Steve got it. Very good discussion. We, we had one other topic that uh, came up there. Uh, we'll deal with it later, which was uh, minimum threshold requirements for scoring. And we'll hold that for another time. Good idea. All right. Thank you. Yeah, we've got uh, the next topic up is the regional solicitation survey results. We've got Bethany Brandt Sargent with us from MTS, and we thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you, Chair and members. Um, we were here a while ago to discuss the survey work we are going to do around the regional solicitation. Um, so I'm here today with some results. Um, the target audiences here were the general public who are residents of the region, uh, with, really with a focus on um, engaging residents who haven't really participated in our processes before. I just wanted um, to make sure you're, you're calling Peter Dugan a member of the general public. Yes. <laughs> Peter so uh, graciously volunteered at one of our intercept surveys. So he, we put him to work uh, interviewing people who came to the community event that Good. we were at. So thanks, Member Dugan. Big thanks to Member Dugan, yes. We doubled the, the record was 15, we get 30. Yes, his in person interview. His intercept survey was the most successful, so I'm going to fully place the praise on him. Uh, the various strategies that we used here was an online survey, which is an opt in survey, so you tend to get the folks who are really involved in our process. Um, we also used a series of promotions through Gov Delivery, social media, Metro Update, and direct emails. We emailed um, more than 40 different cities, municipalities, organizations uh, with direct emails, encouraging them to share. Um, and then we did seven intercept surveys, one in each county, and we did two focus groups. Um, the various uh, different online survey, the intercepts and the focus groups are shown on the screen, along with the um, count of folks who participated. Last year, we only did the online survey and we received about 550 responses. This year, with the combination of the online survey, the intercept surveys, which is where we go out to community, where they are having community events, um, and ask them our same survey questions, and then uh, the two focus groups, one at Prior Lake and one um, virtually held with a community-based organization in St. Paul. The budget exercise was very similar to last year. We gave them $250 million to allocate across the 12 category or 11 categories, and each included a description and an example project. Um, so our survey participants, we were able through the intercept surveys to really capture a good amount of people from Anoka and Carver County. 
Hennepin County, um, the city of Minneapolis did a lot of promotion, so you, that is where you see some of their over-representation. Um, and Scott and Washington County, our Washington County intercept survey was a little bit weird with the lack of winter and focusing on winter festivities, so that became a big scheduling issue um, for the Scott and Washington County locations. Uh, race and ethnicity, we did um, focus our intercept surveys um, and focus groups on those underrepresented communities. This um, is not necessarily satisfactory, but it is an approach and an improvement from last year. So I do want to highlight that our additional efforts were more successful, but there's a lot of work to do in how we do this moving forward. So the budget exercise results, there are two charts here. Um, the average funding is shown in blue, and that is how much money, on average, the survey respondents put into each category. Um, and so you'll see that transit expansion was a, a big priority for everyone. Increasing roadway capacity was the second one, and then transit improvements and roadway modernization. The interesting thing um, on the green chart here is those are the number of people for each response that put in at least $1 to that category. So um, the increasing roadway capacity is the lowest on that, which suggests that people who put money into the roadway capacity category put a lot more money. Um, but there were probably more people who didn't put any money in that category, mm -hmm. which um, is what it is, I guess, not trying to read too much into that. The budget exercise result broken down into the modal funding ranges. Um, we saw 46% in the roadway categories, which is at the very bottom of the modal funding range that you all established. 29% in transit, which is exactly within the range, and 25% um, in bike and ped. And this is over the range, but it is similar to the survey results we saw last year. We also had a question that forced people to select a project type in each of the modal categories. So if you had to spend your money on a roadway project, where would you put that money? And modernization was the priority category in this question. For transit improvement, or for transit, it was transit improvements, and unsurprisingly for bike and pedestrian, it was the multi-use trails and bicycle facilities, which does make sense since that's one of our bigger application categories as well. Um, and the findings really um, were very similar to last year again. Transit expansion was the highest average funding, followed by capacity, transit improvements, and modernization. There is a significant uh, demand or interest in higher bike and ped funding, again, similar to last year. The intercept surveys were really important to get us to um, different communities, and we talked a lot to seniors and folks with young children, which who would not have participated in our process had we not gone out there. So that was an important step, and we can hope to build on it during the next solicitation cycle. So with that, I will ask for any questions on this element of our presentation. Questions? Yes. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So one of the slides that wasn't included in this presentation, but I believe was um, presented to TAC, yes. um, was the use of the vehicle, the use of the transportation as far as he heavy duty, light duty, or did I miss that? Um, I do not think that is in the survey results. Oh, no. What was... what? A Shoot, sorry. Oh, there, no. was, there was something that I was looking at. Many of you, it was on the MnDOT site. But, it, but the, the use of vehicles, um, the, the use of vehicles contributing to greenhouse gases and carbon emissions and things like that. And one of, um, and I can find it just so everybody doesn't think I'm a weirdo. So um, one of the things is that, that light duty and heavy duty vehicles, trucks, are the main user of the roadways main users of transportation. However, they're not incorporated into these survey res respondents. Um, so if, if a lot of the roadways are used by heavy duty, light duty trucks, freight, commerce, commercial businesses, 
um, and a lot of the funding that we're deciding on is roadway, I would, my opinion is that I would love to see those industries involved in this survey so that a major user or contributor of carbon emissions can be asked opinions of because as we can imagine, freight can't ride bikes, they can't go on trails, they have to go on our roadways. And as Commissioner Bingham mentioned, transportation in suburbia is very, very, very different um, than in tight urban communities. So feedback from me on the survey, thank you. Thank you for that, Member Jepson. I will say that we did contact some of those organizations through our gov delivery process, um, but we did rely on them to communicate the information to their members um, and their constituents, which is, I think, why we have such a kind of different um, <coughs> response rate based on the different areas and who we contacted. Um, cities, counties, agencies have a lot of difference in their social media following and what types of regular communications they're doing. So that is something that we can work on who we're targeting the information to for the next cycle. Thank you. Other questions from Ms. Sargent? All right, yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Member, Member Chaudhary. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation and your work on the survey. I, appreciating, I appreciated you noting um, that there was improvements on reaching out to different demographics in our community um, and also noting that the results weren't satisfactory for what we would like to see in terms of representation. I Could we go back to that slide really quick? Yeah, so the representation looks like survey participants, 84% white, 70% white uh, regionally, and I believe in Minnesota, we're around 64, something like that. Um, and I kind of wanted to hear, like, what were things that you saw as improvements from uh, the last time there, there was outreach done on surveys to in, be inclusive of all Minnesotans and different communities, and what do you think would be helpful in the future? Yeah, thank you for that question, member. Um, so the things that we, last cycle, we really only did an online survey. We um, added it as kind of a, an immediate effort to influence some of the solicitation scenarios. This time we did add those seven intercept surveys and included one for each um, county as well as those two focus groups. And we scheduled those two focus groups looking at the various geographic and racial um, results that we had from the opt-in survey. I think moving forward, the focus groups and the intercept surveys were really influential in helping us both geographically and racially um, close some of the gaps. So in the future, doing more of those intercept surveys I think would go a long way, but also partnering with some of our projects um, and the agencies running those transportation projects, there is a lot of overlap that I think we can leverage better. So, but this is only our second year doing yeah. this, so I think we have a lot of learning space as we go forward, and the solicitation evaluation might help set us on the right track. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And um, I know at the city of Minneapolis, obviously Hennepin County was very <laughs> well represented in the survey. Um, I know that there are support systems around uh, a neighborhood community relations department that does some really intentional outreach um, into the black community, Latin community, uh, urban indigenous community, and I think a connection with the Met Council uh, on this in the future, I, I'd be happy to have that. Great, thank yes. you so much. I will not turn that offer down. <laughs> Yes, Member Lindeke. Uh, just to follow up, I think an excellent comment, and I, maybe just think about multi-language uh, surveys as a first step. Yes, um, that was a limitation of our current tool. We did offer translation services for the focus groups, and um, yes, so it is included in our practice. It just was not able to be used for the survey tool that we had. Anyone else? All right, thanks, Ms. Sergeant. 
Thank you. Yeah, interesting information to add to our uh, deliberations. All right, very good. Member again. If, if I can just put in the plug for future surveys. Uh, Bethany is doing a remarkable job. I will say that some of, some of the surveys couldn't be done at uh, the intercept because of the weather, uh, the lack of uh, weather, I should say. But I really encourage us, if we want good surveys, we have to go out to where the people who use the product are. That means seeing the bus station in the rain. Uh, Forest Lake. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I mean, just talking to Mr. Mayor and, you know, <laughs> yeah. kind of but, you know, really <laughs> sitting out there and, you know, having sure the bus go by and spraying the yeah. water and you go to work wet, that's, that's how totally you're going to get quality surveys, in my opinion, or, or as, as a council member, I'm not Commissioner no, Jefferson said, I'm on so like heavy duty trucks to go to a truck stop, you know, ask permission and talk to the vehicle owners as they're there. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good. I'll volunteer to do it. because <laughs> it's the small so that's it the only one. I thought you were going to bring up something about the quality of your photo. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's good. It's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're going to move on to Steve Peterson now. We're going to talk a little bit about regional uh, solicitation funding scenarios and some scoring. So I'll have welcome. A session later, but it doesn't. I will take money. <laughs> Out of yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and this is the first, uh, we don't have to uh, spend a great deal of time on this. You're going to see this the next four months. So again, we're, we're aiming for a July tab decision on the 2024 regional solicitation. So we got met, we have several months to talk about this and um, just wanted to bring forward uh, the really the first, the first steps of that. And um, was, I'm thinking a little bit about Commissioner Jepson's question. And I think it was, uh, at TAC, I think it was the presentation on the greenhouse gas um, federal required measure that you're referencing because I looked up that PowerPoint. But uh, again, we ended up postponing that one indefinitely. But I think that's where that data came from. So, okay, now I've, I've thought through that. Okay. <laughs> so back to the solicitation. Uh, there's also, there, besides this PowerPoint, there's also an attachment with seven pages of a spreadsheet. Uh, what we've done so far is uh, put together a base scenario. Again, this is not all the money. This is yeah. uh, $200 million, and this is the uh, STP, or S Surface Transportation Block Grant Program, and the CMAC dollars. And these are the traditional two funding programs that, that we've had before IIJA. Um, and included in that is a transportation alternatives too, so those three funding pots. So that's what there's. That's where two hundred million dollars come from. We we did not do any over programming. Again, we're, we're going to try and build a base, and then as we get themes and direction from you, we'll keep kind of adding projects to this list. So this is isn't the final um, funding lines by any means. There is somewhere on the magnitude of probably about sixty million dollars or so um, left to go to projects. Uh, some of that is at active transportation. So we talked about that today. It's the carbon uh, reduction that um, Council Member Barber um, directed the two years of funding uh, back into the solicitation. It's, uh, what else did I miss here? Carbon reduction, protect, active transportation, over programming. So those, those four areas are yet to be shown um, in there. And each of those funding programs has a little bit different, uh, you know, different uh, bend to it that we have to kind of keep track of and bring to you in a coherent manner. A few of the questions that we wanted to bring to you to start thinking about for, ne for next month. Uh, two main questions here. Uh, the first of which is uh, the, the modal midpoint. So remember you established those uh, modal funding ranges. The midpoint for transit is 30% of the dollars. So uh, as we start thinking about a reasonable level of over-programming and carbon reduction, some of these other sources, there's more money in the pot than available projects. And so uh, similar to last time, you'll have an opportunity to uh, reuse at least $6 million and put it towards other projects on another list. So you have to be thinking about that. You, um, then the question also becomes, do you want to fund, completely fund out all the, there's 99 transit projects across transit expansion and transit modernization. Do you want to fund all of those, um, which we could do, good projects, or do you want to, uh, like last time you left one project uh, that was a low scoring, kind of the last project on the list, transferred that money to bike pad and funded more projects there. So again, that's that's up to you, but something to start thinking about as you look at the lists and the projects and 
and the money available. Uh, number two uh, question to start noodling on is how much over programming you'd like to do. The last few cycles, um, we've done uh, somewhere between eight and 12%, the last two or three cycles of over programming. Um, and that's again, you heard Dan Erickson from MnDOT State Aid a few months ago gave a, a good presentation, talked about how we use over programming as a good strategy as projects drop out of the system where we're getting more money through new federal bills. Uh, that's a way to have more projects in the federal pipeline available to take those dollars uh, versus mm -hmm. uh, giving, giving the money back essentially, um, either to MnDOT and we, we'd never give it back to the federal government. We, we find ways to use it, but um, it, is, it is better to have projects from your list that are scored and ranked um, in the system as scope changes and other things come up. So two, two questions there. Uh, one discussion item here on the last slide and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, with the additional funds, uh, and it's not all the funds, but with the additional funds of over-programming and likely carbon reduction, uh, staff would like to put together some funding themes or funding scenarios like we have in the past to bring back to you next month. So that would be somewhere on the order of maybe $40 million or so. Uh, a few of the items, a few of the ideas that we brought to TAC earlier this month would be to follow the same methodology and distribute uh, the funds in a similar fashion as you see on the spreadsheets. So we could do that, uh, midpoint recalling that. Uh, idea number two is to do a bike pad heavy scenario. Again, that's one that you saw uh, in the 2022 cycle and that would follow the survey results that you just heard about from Bethany um, because people did that um, budget tool and we would say, okay, collectively out of the 700 surveys, this is what the budget tool said, here's the public input here's an option that would depict what that would be. And the third one would be, and this would just be in the roadways category, we would uh, take the, those last few dollars in and try and maximize safety based on a common measure that's in um, all of the, most of the roadway categories and say, if we're gonna choose the next project on this list or that, that list, we should choose this one because it has a higher safety benefit. Um, that's based on a benefit cost ratio um, that is in those applications. So those are three of the ideas that uh, we'd propose to bring back to you next month. Uh, we can add more either at a later date um, or now if people have other ideas that they'd like staff to develop. But this was our, our thinking to at least get the ball rolling that, uh, you know, we don't want 10. That was maybe too, too onerous last time when we had a, too many scenarios that we brought back to call the list down. But uh, here's, here's three ideas we had to start thinking. Sure. Thank you. Um, you know, first of all, I appreciate you bringing something to us uh, um, behind, um, um, with some ideas to start to ponder. And I'm going to think about this a little bit further and see if there's something else. But there was one thing that I did bring up when we talked about safety because I asked for a better definition of safety. And one of the things that has to be on our mind is what happened in Baltimore with a bridge falling. And of course, we've had a bridge fall here. And the fact that our bridges are aging, and we actually lowered the amount of money that we were giving to bridges. So we went from 15 to 10. And now I don't know where our bridges stand, but I'm going to ask my staff to try to draft, because I, I had a draft some years ago about, and not just my county, but throughout the metro area and all the counties about the aging infrastructure and where your bridges fall. We might want to think about that, because I think the federal government's going to be looking at that, too. And there may be some requirements where we, maybe we ought to think about getting ahead of it. Just a thought. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Other thoughts? Yeah, so, Steve, was it your uh, goal today to try to get some initial thoughts from the group, uh, or were you just kind of setting the stage for thinking about this until we get to the next meeting, understanding that we have about a four-month yeah. process ahead of us? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. More to prime the pump, pump a little bit to get you thinking for next meeting. And um, if there's no objection, I think we would develop these scenarios that you see on the screen, and then uh, you can tell us if you like the direction we're going or if we need to uh, go a different way. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how to frame this, but we had a little bit of an earlier discussion, thinking about the over-programming piece of things. Um, you know, if we over-programmed a little on the lighter side, and maybe if there was some that came back or left over, you know, we talked about unique studies earlier. Maybe there's a way we could have a demonstration project uh, or a, a study just to see how that works, use some of those dollars and, and not set up a specific unique studies categories John mentioned this year, but fold uh, it in somehow and within the over-programming. 
if, if there's, you know, if we get projects that don't go work. Sure. And Mr. Chair, and maybe uh, on that point, right now in the scenarios oh, that we'll bring you next month, we have set aside four and a half million dollars, and that was a set aside for unique projects. And again, we don't know if unique projects is going to continue in that form or something different. It could be planning studies that we want to do in the region, but um, we we have set aside at least a sum amount of money f uh, for near-term uses, up to Tab's discretion, and maybe that that's. An, one of many ideas we can we can ponder. Yeah. I think Elaine had a quick comment yeah. too. Actually, Steve said what I was going to say. Okay. okay. All right. Very good. All right. Thanks. Commissioner Bingham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I don't I don't know um, if I'll be back next month if Commissioner Karwaski uh, is here. Um, but I guess my my feedback would be um, transit looks different in the suburbs. And as I'm looking at this, if we don't do something with the distribution and the solicitation funding. You look at the uh, trails, bikes, heads, um, with the exception of one, they all go to Minneapolis or Hennepin, and then there's one that go to the wonderful community of South St. Paul. So um, the equity side of it and the distribution of it is very, very important and it still lacks. So if we do not do something with that, we are still going to run into the same problem as in the in the ring collar counties that we are trying to expand our service for transit. This is a, a problem for us as we are trying to close gaps on that last mile, um, as we are trying to further expand and increase ridership, bring workforce in. We have the same problems that everybody else does when it comes to workforce, when it comes to getting access accessibility to medical appointments for our most vulnerable population. Who the heck knows what's going to go on with Uber and Lyft? Let's not even go down that rabbit hole. But this um, not being able to have, um, you know, the transit and micro transit and the bike pads and all this stuff is just going to exasperate that um, issue in the suburbs and this. Distribution formula shows that it is not equitable um, to to that. So I just challenged this. Um, and you're like, you're looking at the highlighted scenario. Yes. Yeah. The, yes. the midpoint. Yeah. Which is what I think it is represents yeah. the midpoint. And, and so um, there's over programming. That's something to look at. I don't know, but um, that's just my two cents. Um, and I know a lot of work goes into this, um, but this is just one of the the frustrations I. I think, and I also just for the record want to point out that Mayor Bailey and I haven't been on an official committee for 18 years together, so it's nice to be <laughs> back on. We were last on the council together 18 years ago, so this is our first meeting 18 years ago. Anyway. So, so what, I hear you, what I hear you saying is just affirming this notion that whatever funding scenario we end up choosing when we get into that stage, that we don't forget to put that geographic balance lens on everything. Yeah, and I think just keeping in mind that transit looks different in the suburbs than it does in Minneapolis, than it does in, in St. Paul and, and the, the core urban cities. Even in, even in, I would argue that Commissioner Martinson and Commissioner Gattel's districts that are more, um, wait, no, you don't really have. Yes, I do. Yeah, suburban areas. I mean, you guys both have a little bit of, it. it we use transit for, I mean, we have housing projects on top of, and developments on top of our transit stations in Newport. Um, it's mothballed because Met Council and Metro Transit will not start the service back up yet. So, I mean, I have trails, beautiful popular trails right now that the county has, has put money towards um, and are highly utilized so that we can connect, you know, people to, um, housing, uh, and we don't have transit available there because we don't have service anymore. So those are the types of things that we are looking at, at, at utilizing from that perspective. And yet, you look at these options right here, it's Minneapolis that's getting the exception of South St. Paul. All right. So just yeah, put it there. Um, uh, yeah. Now I've started something. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. You're welcome, yeah, that's, Stan. That's okay. That's right. <laughs> I was about to sit down here, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Chair and, and members, what I'd say especially on the active on the bike pad once we add in some of this active transportation dollars that really helps the list 
um, particularly on the multi-use trail where you've got a lot of big dollar projects, big bike, I mean, yeah. we're spending five million, five million, five, and that eats up a lot of the money that was directed towards bike pad. So once we add in some of these other sources, including active transportation, I think it helps with the uh, spread of at least the bike pad projects, and you'll see that next month. Uh, member Brian Martinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> so my comments actually speak to this a bit. I want to mention first uh, an issue about this question of safety. And, and I, I fully support a greater emphasis on safety. I think those who are here and remember, remember that I was one of the people advocating for an even, an even heavier weighting of the safety score in the overall regional solicitation than what we, we did bump it up last time around uh, by a certain percent. I was arguing even, it should go even further than that. What I, I think would be a bad idea for us to move towards a special, like a safety funding category, however, because everything we're doing, everything that we're considering funding should have a safety element to it. We should be aiming to increase safety through every project that we do. Every project should have to be scored on that criterion. That's one point. The second point about the, the, how, we, how, we, how we spend the bike ped money and the active transportation money. So you have, you have the bike ped heavy option here, but what I would like to see staff do and I would like to see TAB consider is <clears throat> the creation of, a, of, a, of a, new, a new category of funding that, so we could have um, network-based or large-scale um, active transportation system building category to separate it from small projects, to separate it from you know, safe routes to school, to separate it from smaller bike ped projects that might be, that might be engaged in. If you, see, if you look around the world, the, the, the cities around the world that have done uh, bike systems successfully have built them out with large investments in a very concentrated period of time, typically within no more than two to three years. Austin, Texas is doing that right now, right now. And so we have the opportunity to do that using the regional, the, uh, the, the regional sales tax funding to do that and, and make that in addition to what we do for the bike ped category that we currently have. That would allow us to fund a lot more of the smaller bike ped projects a lot further down that, a lot down that scale. And as I noted in exec, Look at how the scores go on all those bike ped projects. They don't fall off a cliff. They stay, they're high, 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 well, a little bit lower, a little bit lower, a little bit lower, a little bit lower. They don't fall off a cliff until you get almost to the bottom of that list. That means there are a slew of high scoring projects that we're not funding in that category already. If we, so I don't wanna see just a bike heavy option. My preference would be for us to have a separate category to build out the regional bike transportation network, for instance. That would be one thing we could do. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Martinson. Uh, Commissioner Holberg and then uh, Member Johnson. So I, I know this is like the 10,000 foot level that we're really gonna have these discussions moving forward, but I would raise uh, three points in preparation for the deep dive, and these are not new. Um, a minimum performance standards, kind of like what uh, Member Martinson is talking about in some categories. You score 90% of the points, you still don't get funding. In some categories, you score less than half the points, and you do get funding. So, And then the historical geographic balance, Dakota County way underperforms. And so I would like the last 10 years um, in a dollar amount by population, what each county would have gotten had it was been a straight dollar appropriation in the last uh, five solicitation rounds based on population figure, and then how much above or below the line they would need to catch up for an uh, equity position in the next uh, round of solicitation. You can do that. And then the other one is the stuff you did last time where you show what percentage of the funding gets funded. Elaine did it for me. It was an Excel spreadsheet. So... You would, it, it equates to the uh, basic performance standard where in transit, if you, find, if you get 30% of the points, you're funded, where in roads, if you have to be at 90% to get funded. <coughs> they did a little chart that showed that the range and that there's no minimum performance standard for funding. Okay. Il illustrated across the categories. Thanks. I think we can, yep, I think we can do all of those. Um, I remember Elaine putting that together. But, yep. I'm going to Member Johnson, then it's Member Barber, Linda Key, Jenkins, Jepson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of comments, and I think, um, again, Member Bigham, because a good point with 
it's hard to sort of wrap your head around all the different pieces. I mean, active transportation very specifically. I mean, I remember finding out, oh, the counties have basically twice as much money as but we're going to get for TAB for active transportation. And so, you know, we asked, um, you know, representatives from the group, sometimes it was staff, sometimes it was, you know, commissioners who, who know what their counties are thinking about. And the answer was, this takes a lot of time to set up a process for figuring out how this money is going to be spent. And so I, I don't want to put this on, you know, Amy, who's presenting next about where all the funding categories come from. But, you know, it's just really tough to wrap your head around because you might look at one funding source and say, well, this feels like it's going to skew really heavily because of how you would apply to it. So it's going to cover only certain projects, certain geographies are going to score really well because of the parameters. And I think that's really tricky to think about um, because we can't get a holistic view of this and it's very challenging to do so. So I just want to put that out there. Point taken, for sure. It's really challenging to sort of think about this stuff um, because, again, we have one funding source coming to us at TAB. There are other funding sources coming from other places. How do we keep those pieces in mind and try to think about geographic uh, balance, all these things, it's incredibly challenging, incredibly challenging. Uh, and then the only other thing I would say is that, you know, I will directly answer Steve's question, which is these seem like good things to develop for scenarios. But, um, you know, I signed up for the 2026 uh, evaluation to have this discussion. I, it's going to be huge. I mean, it's been 10 years, I believe, 12 years since the last time around. I mean, th there's so many things that have changed in that uh, small tweaks have been made over the years. We have new funding sources. There are certain things that are dedicated to certain types of projects, but not others. You know, for everyone who signed up for this, maybe I'll give the pitch of if you want to, please also come to the meetings. And I don't know if the door's still open for more people joining that work group, but it's going to be a lot. Okay, maybe it's not, but keep an eye on what we're doing because it's a lot of work, a lot of work, and a lot of things to think about. So I'll just state that. Thanks. Thank you. No comment. Okay. All right. Let's go over to Member Barber. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, Dr. Dutch, I agree that that work group is going to be very interesting. There's a lot that has changed, and we're also coming out with a new version of the transportation policy plan, and these things are all going to kind of work together. So some of the questions of, you know, which funding sources, uh, geographic um, um, distribution, uh, what transportation looks like in different areas should all kind of come together and hopefully be reflected in all of that. Um, I did have a question, though, for uh, uh, Commissioner Bigham, because I'm looking at transportation or like the transit expansion and modernization and of the six projects that are highlighted five are suburban so I don't I'm, are, are you talking more about the bike head category and mm -hmm. trails because that's going to look very different once it mm -hmm. has the carbon reduction um, funds and the active transportation but I just wanted to make sure and clarify that okay that's, thank you thank you uh, member Lindeke uh, thank you mr. chair uh, I just uh, wanted to write think out loud about um, Commissioner Bigham's uh, point, but I was thinking about the transit expansion category also, and there's five submissions from MVTA and Metro Transit, the only two agencies only submit those, and um, you know, it's not a long list, and four of them got, uh, got funded, and in the survey, transit expansion was a very high priority for people, that's what we want to see. So I'd just be interested in hearing more from Metro Transit specifically about why these projects got picked and what the thought process goes through uh, for, for those that being the submissions in front of us. Because it's not like we can fund more and there's only one more project um, to, to fund, right? Um, so uh, I'd like, I just am curious, can we get more transit expansion options or what are the challenges? What are the limitations? That's the question I have, and I don't know the answer. You, got, you had Elaine shooting her hand right yeah. up there. She was gonna... <laughs> Part of the, with this solicitation, Metro Transit did scale back on their applications because they're still recovering from the COVID cutbacks, um, the driver shortage, things like that. That they can't even expand transit. <laughs> yeah, because they're still trying to scale back up to their original service. And so they put in fewer applications till they can accommodate what they right. are putting in right now. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. 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 Member Jenkins, I think, was next. Yeah, so uh, along the lines that we've all been talking about, first I'll qualify, I'm an East Metro person, so um, I have adapted my travel um, accordingly over the, since the pandemic with transit and stuff on the East Metro. So I understand Commissioner Bingham's point. My question comes as a member of the TAB who's not been through solicitation before. Um, just a couple questions. One, um, I understand when we look at transit, it looks 
very, you know, urban core. But on the whole, do communities get to say, hey, you know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna get upset about equity across the whole spectrum of the regional solicitation, first glance, no calculator, it looks pretty balanced suburban to urban, but are there requirements that within categories there is some equity or is that equity discussion limited to the entire regional solicitation? And then I have a follow-up. Steve. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, we tend to look at it uh, in its entirety, the whole solicitation, and as Commissioner Holberg said, we tend to do it over time because mm -hmm. these projects are lumpy at seven and 10 million. Um, project so we tend to look at it sometimes over as much as 10 years to say as the east east metro received x amount of money relative to its population or jobs okay so, yep and then my follow-up is do project sponsors and i'll i'll clump this into communities whether it's cities or counties or whatever once they see the initial scoring could a county come back and say gee I, I've got this road project, but my transit project got bumped. We were next out from consideration. Can, after scoring, a community come back and say, gee, if I had my druthers, can you put off the road project and bump me up on transit? Yeah, Mr. Chair and members, uh, the answer to that is no. Um, that did come up last time in the, um, that, uh, a certain county had a preference for one project or the next, but we haven't we haven't uh, treated the solicitation like that. You can choose this project or that on this on on some of the lists. That ha that topic has come up in our listening sessions that we've been doing with many of you across the region. This interplay of local or disconnect of local priorities versus maybe a regional scoring system, and sometimes how they butt heads. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe what you're getting at a little bit here. Well, and it's counties against transit yeah. providers. So it's different. Might be a different applicant. So, like in Dakota County, MVTA and Metro Transit operate transit, so they're like in a different realm. Yeah. So maybe my my example should have been a road project versus active transit, where you've got both projects are county. Can you come back and say, gee? No. I, I want okay. That's what I wanted to find out. <laughs> I want to I want to get another perspective on the equity issue that you raised because I think Steve was thinking you were talking about geographic balance. And, uh, and I, I, Lane, that was the first question. Yeah, the so first your first question. the first question was was is the is the balance on the entire yeah. solicitation or by category? By category, and I've yeah. got that. No, it's complete. Entire. It's the complete solicitation, not by category. Is the yep. answer. Correct, yep. The second one was, once we've done a grading, can the applicants come back and go, oh, you gave me this one, but if I had one or the other, can I switch it? Yeah, no. You answered that. So thank you. Yep. All right. All right. Uh, and then it is um, Commissioner Jepson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to help answer some questions from my perspective, um, thank you to Commissioner Bigham for your impassioned comments. I won't duplicate them, but echo them. Uh, midpoint distribution, I highly encourage all of us to continue looking at the midpoint ranges, even though some of the uh, survey results countered uh, what we had already decided on. I think, again, my, my opinion about getting different industries that are high users of our transportation system should also be included. I think having around 700 respondents in the seven county metro making a decision on how we spend $250 million. Um, that's a very, very low number of respondents, um, as well as um, for, for bike ped heavy. Um, the regional solicitation is already bike ped heavy because every road project, almost every single road project has a bike ped component to it. So increasing the bike ped category even more um, just takes those dollars away from other much needed projects. Um, including, just to comment on active transportation, counties and cities are also getting money. So I would caution um, certain bike ped 
projects because those projects might be able to get funded from another way through um, the county and the city dollars. So let's, I think a lot of that is gonna have to settle. A lot of that is gonna have to be shaken out um, to understand what county and cities are gonna do to work together to come up with their policies and procedures for funding those bikes and ped trails. Uh, finally on safety, uh, yes, every project has to have a safety component, but as I mentioned earlier, um, safety is a big, huge concern in this state. 84 people have already died this year. And a lot of that is about roadway design. And the mass, a large part of the roadway design is in the sub suburbs because we haven't gotten the attention that we need. The city of Blaine has expanded, has, um, expanded 20% in population, but our roadways have not accommodated that large number of increase. It has to have a safety component to it because people are dying. Um, and to put a greater weight on that to understand and look at those maps of where those cross crashes are happening and what we can actually do to prevent someone from dying, we need to do that and make that a priority. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. And then back to <laughs> Member Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And very quickly, actually, um, for uh, Member Lindicki, um, for Metro Transit, if you look at it, one of the big things that TAB has, has decided to do was to have the $25 million set aside rather than Metro Transit to submit four or five applications for an ABRT. And um, this one, um, you know, we've been, had several successful rides, a lot of active construction for anyone who has been out, and they're by far probably our highest ridership lines and most resilient ones. And um, the money in this cycle is for the H line. So for my East Siders, it's for the Como Maryland corridor. So this is a really, really big connector for the East Side of the Metro. Thank you, Member Barber. Uh, well, Steve, I don't know if we've answered your key questions. You've had some good thoughts from yes. folks on the tab, but um, maybe generally there's a, a sense of where you ought to be heading. Uh, and we'll continue this conversation, of course, about yes. uh, these key questions that we'll you be, have and, yeah, we'll, and some we'll alternative next choices. Month, that we then get. we'll sprinkle in next some more of the more money. So, all right. Thank you. All right. Very good. Uh, and I'm only bringing this portion of the conversation to a close because we've been holding Amy Venowitz off for several months now, and uh, John Ulrich is tired of it. He wants this. He wants this presentation. I think we've been holding you off for a few months too. He, he said. Um, uh, he said, Hublin, get, Hublin, get her back here." I, I, I asked this. I asked this question months ago, and he, she never gets back on the agenda. So, here she is. All right, Mr. Chair and members, Amy Venowitz with Transportation Planning. Um, here to talk with you today about transportation finance for the region in total. So stepping back from the regional solicitation and uh, really focusing on how do all the pieces fit together of the funding as, as a whole. And I think, um, as was pointed out, and then at the end of the presentation, move back to the regional solicitation funding and how, how can that best fit with the picture as a whole. So I will fess up, I have timed myself because this is a very dense presentation, lots of numbers and figures and it takes me about 40 minutes with no questions at all. <coughs> and so what I was planning to do was to pause at four different parts of the presentation, allow you to ask some questions, clarify the information. And I'm guessing if I do that, this is probably gonna take closer to an hour. So I'm gonna dive in, I will go through it fairly fast, but if I don't get through it all, we can always come back next month too. So if that works for you all. The overall purpose of today's presentation is really threefold. The first is to provide, as I said, that high level summary of transportation revenues and spending. Where does the money come from? How do we, how do we spend it? And then put it into perspective. How does it compare across agencies and across purposes? And uh, what are the total amounts of spending that are occurring? The second, um, major goal today is really to describe the 2023 legislative changes 
As you are all aware, last year's legislation was really very historic. A lot of funding changes and increases in my 30-year career and involvement in transportation funding. Really the most significant actions I've ever seen took place last session, so we'll talk about those specifically. And then at the end of the presentation, as I said, we will go back to the regional solicitation funds and uh, maybe offer some thoughts and perspective on how that funding might best fit into the regional picture as a whole and where it can fill some important gaps. Throughout the presentation, I am going to be quoting a lot of different numbers, uh, but I will be quoting first an annual figure, which kind of represents calendar year 2025 or a, an annual in the short term. And then I will be talking about funding between 2025 and 2050, uh, which is a 26 year time frame. Uh, a little strange of a time frame, but that represents the time frame that is in the transportation policy plan. And after the presentation today, I think you will be having released to you the finance chapter along with the investment chapters for the transportation policy plan for, uh, for review if you so choose. So before we dig in, a couple high level messages. The first is that transportation funding in the state, in the region, is very complicated. We have a lot of different funding sources. Most of them come through constitutional or statutory formulas. Most of them are dedicated to specific purposes or specific modes. They have limited flexibility. The 2023 legislative changes do kind of improve the flexibility, but in large part, it still continued the practice of allocating the funds for specific purposes and modes. Uh, also about the 23 legislation, we have increased funding across the board. All entities, all modes, all purposes really won. Uh, but as you'll see throughout the presentation, not everyone necessarily won to the same degree or same level as the others. So a high level look at the 2023 legislation, lots of changes and increases to state taxes. I'm gonna go through most of these in detail, but just to list them off here, there was a new three quarter cent regional transportation sales tax that went to transit, active transportation, and to metro counties. We've already been talking about that quite a bit today. There was an indexed gas tax, indexed to the, uh, cost of construction, the vehicle registration tax was increased, and also that motor vehicle sales tax, which is not listed here, the rate for the MBES tax was also increased. There was a statutory dedication of the sales tax on auto parts, and that went to both the highway user fund, so all roadways benefited. And then it also specifically went to local governments through a new account called the Transportation Advancement Account. We'll go into detail on that. And then finally, there was a new state delivery fee created that also goes to the Transportation Advancement Account and is primarily allocated to local governments. In addition to the 23 legislation, you probably all remember the 2020 one federal legislation, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also called the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or Bill, same thing. Um, so that legislation also provided increases to the state that are still kind of being realized and coming in. It provided increases in two specific ways. First, it increased what we call our federal formula funds. MnDOT transit providers and then us as a region receive federal formula funds. That's the NHPP funds, the STPBG, the bridge funds, the HSIP funds. All of those formula programs received increases through the 2021 legislation. And the numbers that I will be talking about today include the federal formula fund increases. And so that, that has been considered as part of what you're seeing. We also through IIJA, as you know, 
there were, they created a lot of new competitive funding programs. Most of the new programs are kind of geared to what I call emerging or evolving topics in transportation. They revolve around safety, carbon reduction and resilience, reconnecting communities, and EV infrastructure. So the figures you're seeing today do not account for competitive funds, unless, of course, we've already received them. Um, but it's very hard to predict where we will be successful in the future in getting federal competitive funds. And what I would say is the numbers you're seeing today, I would consider kind of a base level of funding. This is money that we know we're going to receive. Um, it's existing taxes, existing legislation. And the good news is that we probably can see it go up from there through these competitive programs, both at the federal level, and there has been an increasing um, amount of state, fed, state competitive programs that have also been created. And so that may occur, and you might see higher numbers realized into the future. So as I go through this, I'm going to talk about revenue and spending in three primary categories. And I would note these are the same categories used in the Transportation Policy Plan. They're also used in the TIP. So we typically think about our revenues and spending first, the MnDOT bucket. And specifically in the metro area, it's the MnDOT Metro District. How does the state spend money on state highways? Um, through the metro district. The second bucket is regional transit providers. This uh, metro transit is by far the largest provider, but when I am providing transit revenues and spending in the presentation, it really includes all providers and also the MTS providers, metro mobility and contracted services. So it's a holistic look at transit. And then the final revenue and spending category is local governments. And that includes, obviously, the cities, counties, and townships within the region. And then there is a fourth category, the regional funds. And that category really is just a revenue fund. So we will talk about the money that comes to the region through the federal revenues and through active transportation. But then those revenues are typically allocated out to one of the other three categories, MnDOT Metro District, transit providers, local governments, um, and the active transportation providers would be included within the local government category too. So that's kind of the structure of the presentation you will be seeing. Um, uh, I'll go through this quickly. The MnDOT Metro District, we'll talk about that first. Their spending is primarily 90 plus percent on state highways, capital, and operations. MnDOT does spend on transit, bike, and pedestrian, but very rarely, and I can't even think of an example, as what I would call standalone projects. So when MnDOT is spending in the Metro District on transit, bike, and ped, it is part of a bigger overall roadway project. And uh, I know it's an important part of those projects. What I do not have for you today, and I'm guessing this question will come up, is how much is it? And that is something we're working on trying to identify and get information on. Uh, but at this point, we just recognize it is a part of the state highway projects. Regional transit, the funding that you'll be seeing in here is for all transit providers operating in capital purposes for both the bus and the transit way system. So both systems. Similar to MnDOT, transit also spends on bike and pedestrian projects, but when they do so, it's usually part of a bigger overall transit project. Very rarely, if ever, would they do a standalone bike and pedestrian project. Then the third category, local government. Local governments are a little different than the other two. Their spending is a little bit broader. By far, the majority of local government spending is on the local roadway system. The minor arterials, collectors, local roads, that is the spending that we're talking about primarily. 
but local governments also spend money significantly on bike and ped projects, and they are the entities that do what we call the standalone projects, the projects that you see on the regional solicitation list. The applicants tend to be the local governments or at times the park um, districts and park entities, which are I also consider local governments. Then I should note that increasingly, counties in particular, and probably some city spending, also goes back to MnDOT state highways. And that is a trend that has been increasing over time. And we can talk a little bit about why that's been happening. But it's been primarily because MnDOT's funding has been so restricted and limited over the past decade. And then in addition, counties collect a regional sales tax, which they in turn, a portion of that comes back to transit for spending by the transit providers. So the, those revenues are local revenues that get shifted back to transit or the MnDOT Metro District. This slide looks at spending in the region in total. As you can see, almost five billion annually. So that's a huge number of transportation spending that's occurring in the region. Over the 26 year forward look of the transportation policy plan, over 170 billion will be spent in the region on transportation. A couple key things to note on this slide, uh, and this is, I'm gonna stay on this slide, the, the takeaways are actually on the next slide. A um, couple things to note is that the largest category of spending is local government at almost 50% of the transportation spending that is occurring. And then if I were to break that down further, the local government share is approximately one third counties, two thirds cities. Um, I have to quick do the math in my head, but that's, that's kind of a breakdown of that 47%. Second largest share is regional transit at 32%, and then followed up with MnDOT Metro State Highways at 19. And then you will see at the very bottom here, um, the regionally allocated revenues, the federal revenues and the active transportation revenues at two to 3% of total transportation spending. So a very small share of the overall spending, but a very important share in that it is the most flexible source of funding that we have, and it's the source of funding that we can kind of direct to where you need it to go or where you want it to go, where you see existing gaps in how the other transportation revenues are being spent. Then um, looking at the right-hand slide, part of this slide, a couple other things I wanted to point out. The largest single source of revenue in total is the local property tax. Now, and that makes sense, the largest spender, local government, largest source of funding is local property tax at 22% of total revenues within the region. Um, another thing I would point out is the state aid from the Highway User Fund, both the Highway user fund money that goes to MnDOT, which is at 14%, followed up by the local government state aid at 11%, so that's 25% of the total transportation comes spending and revenues comes through the gas tax, registration tax, motor vehicle sales tax. Um, so it is a large so source, but it represents three separate taxes. Um, with that, I am going to be moving on. Oh, a few additional takeaways. I think I've covered all of these takeaways here. Um, and I did mostly mention this, that the vast, that there's very limited flexibility in the vast majority of transportation revenues. They can't be moved around in ways that entities might like them to be moved around. The regional solicitation funding is the most flexible source of funding that we have available. You have a lot of flexibility in shifting it across purposes and modes. And I will note the new transportation advancement account that we will be talking about that goes to local governments and primarily to metro counties. 
does offer some flexibility, but even with that account, the legislation specified shares of funding across different purposes that we will talk about. And then the new regional sales tax also has some flexibility with how counties can spend it. Clearly, the share that goes to transit must be spent on transit. Within that, there are some options on how it can be spent. And then the active transportation funding within the bike and ped category, you have the flexibility of determining how that funding should be spent. So that's the very high level look before I dive in and starting with MnDOT Metro District and then transit providers. Um, but I will pause there and see if there are any questions at the high level before I move on. Questions from members at this point in time? All right, I think you can keep going. Thank no, you. All right, well, so clear as a bell. All right, uh, the state <clears throat> revenue chain, uh, changes. To, I first would note the numbers you're seeing uh, were created by MnDOT as part of the work they did on the Minnesota State Highway Investment Plan or MNSHIP and they do include the 2023 increases. So MnDOT's primary source of funding comes from both the highway user tax distribution fund and then federal revenues and then the Revenues that are in the Highway Tax Distribution Fund are split 62% to MnDOT and then the remainder to local governments. So the 62% State Highway User Fund saw a lot of changes last year. Specifically, the gas tax was indexed to uh, the cost of construction beginning in 2024. There's a maximum of a 3% increase. Um, what I've heard from MnDOT and we're still working out the details on this, but the rate is set to go from 28.5 cents to 31.8 effective this coming January. So about a three cent increase per gallon. The vehicle registration tax was increased. They changed the depreciation schedule. They added a surcharge for electric vehicles, $75 annually. Um, and they also gave a slight decrease to any vehicle that is over 11 years old. You got a $5 a year decrease. So that was the registration tax changes. The motor vehicle sales tax rate was increased from 6.5% to 6.875%. And then what I think is really the most significant change is the statutory dedication of the sales tax on auto parts, which was previously in the state general fund, is now dedicated to the highway user fund, 43.5%, and the remainder is dedicated to this transportation advancement account for local governments. In total, if you take all of those changes that took place, it resulted in about a 17% increase to MnDOT for what we call their capital construction spending over their previous planning estimates. And so as part of MNSHIP, we had estimated on the order of 30 billion um, in revenues. They are now estimating 36 billion in revenues. However, they have $52 billion in need. So while these increases are large and significant, there is still a strong level of unmet need, both within the state and within the Metro District. Uh, this is the look at the Metro District's revenue and spending. The revenue comes, as I mentioned, about three quarters of MnDOT's revenue comes through the highway user taxes, about one fourth comes from the federal formula funds that the state receives. In calendar year 2028, and I'm quoting 2028 um, for a complicated reason, but it's the, it was the first non-stip year after these increases took place. But um, we can expect in the metro region about 800, almost $850 million of annual spending by the MnDOT Metro District, 
and then they split that spending between construction and state road operations about a three quarter of it goes to state road construction and one quarter goes to state road operations total spending over the time period of the transportation policy plan getting close to 33 billion dollars over the 26 years one of the things i want to note is some of you have seen both i and steve peterson up here over the past at least five or six years talking about an issue of a declining share coming to the MnDOT Metro District. Over a decade ago, the MnDOT Metro District primarily received 42.6%, uh, that was the agreement of MnDOT's total revenues. That had been a longstanding agreement, and then a decade ago, as we moved towards asset preservation, because Greater Minnesota has a much larger system, many more miles of system in Greater Minnesota and, and aging pavements and bridges. There was a shift of funding as we paid attention to those asset management needs out of the metro area into the Greater Minnesota districts. So our share of funding has been falling, um, averaging 37 to 38% of total state revenues, but in a couple years, it was 35% or even lower. So that was of concern to us, and we made it known to MnDOT that that was concerning. And one of their responses was to create a, a work group that would look at how they distribute funding throughout the state. And I was able to participate along with Steve Peterson, Joel McPherson from Anoka County, and uh, Lisa Fries from Scott County also participated on that group. The good news is that the recommendation of that group and that, that was adopted by MnDOT increased the Metro share to 43.5% of total MnDOT state funding. So that is really a significant increase to the Metro area. And if you combine the increases we received through the 2023 legislation, and then the fact that MnDOT <coughs> Metro District is going to get a higher share of those revenues, MnDOT Metro District is looking on the order of about a 25% increase between pre-2023 and th their current levels of funding. So a very significant increase for the Metro District. Um, and then, as I also mentioned, that it is uh, kind of the bottom level for them. There's a lot of other opportunities through the federal competitive programs and through the state corridors of commerce program and potentially other programs to also bring that level of spending up. I am going to pause here and see if there are any questions. Unfortunately, Connie Sahibjam is not here today to add any additional detail on that, but any questions on the Metro District spending before I move on to regional transit? Oops. Okay. Keep, All right. Keep moving forward, I'd say. Regional transit also saw a number of taxes that were increased. As I mentioned earlier, the MVEST rate was increased and transit receives 40% of those revenues. Unfortunately for the metro area, the legislation was also changed to give us a smaller share. And so our share went from 36% to 34.3% of MBES revenues. And the overall result of those two competing changes is that the MBES revenues for the metro area remain essentially neutral over time. So not a, not a decrease, which is good news. Um, the other big change, we're all aware of the new three quarter cent metro area sales tax for transit purposes. The council receives 83% of those revenues, 95% goes to transit, 5% to you to, to allocate for active transportation. Um, and the transit piece of the regional sales tax revenue, the estimate for 2025 is $450 million on an annual basis, 17.3 billion over the 26 year period of the plan. 
The state legislation did also put 13 required activities that had to be funded within that legislation. Um, most of those activities, there was funding and every intent to already spend on those activities. So the, the legislation really was not very limiting in how the, the new revenues could be used. Another major change that was in the legislation was a change to shift the responsibility on how we pay for transit, dedicated transitway operations. Previously, dedicated transitway operations had been paid 50% after fares by counties, 50% by the state. Uh, a few years ago, the state got rid of their obligation and so that that has become a regional obligation. And in the 2023 legislation, the counties are no longer required to pay for the cost of transitway operations. So that shifted funding from the council or funding responsibility from the council back or from the counties to the council. The shift is about a $45 million shift in responsibility to the council in 2025 and 3.5 billion 2025 through 2050. This slide shows uh, regional transit revenues on uh, the left hand side and the amounts received and then the percentages are on the right hand side um, in a pie chart format. What you can see here that is probably the most significant is that the regional sales tax, the new regional sales tax, is now 31% of the total funding for regional transit. So the largest funding source that transit now has is from the new regional sales tax. Um, and we'll talk about it a little bit. You can imagine that without that funding source, the the regional transit system was really looking at some very, very significant shortfalls. And um, so it was nothing short of a miracle to have that revenue come into the system. The motor vehicle sales tax is now the second largest, has been dethroned here. It provides 26% of the overall funding for transit purposes, and then followed by the state general fund and state bonds. Uh, the state general fund is almost fully dedicated in 2026 and on to the operations of Metro Mobility, the ADA, the regional ADA service. That change occurred, I believe, in the 2022 state law, and we have been planning for that shift. Uh, so the responsibility after accounting for Metro Mobility fares and Metro Mobility federal funds will now 100% be on the state general fund. The final piece I will note here is that um, the county sales tax and regional rail funds, 3% of total revenue, along with the federal capital investment grant or new starts funding, Together, total 6% of the funding, and that funding is dedicated towards building the future dedicated transit ways that are in the transportation policy plan for the region. And that includes completion of Southwest, the Blue Line extension, completion of Gold Line, the Purple Line, uh, and the Riverview Corridor are the dedicated transit ways in the TPP. Uh, I think I went through most of these takeaways. Uh, I should note the fair revenues are a fairly minor piece of the overall way that we fund transit in the region. Currently at about 5% of the total in 2025 and growing to 8% of the total over time as ridership, we hope, continues to recover post-pandemic. This last slide, um, oh, this next slide, excuse me, is looking at the same level of revenues, the 1.7 billion annually, but how it gets spent within the region. So the two top 
expenditures are for the existing bus system operating and capital totaling together 63% of transit revenues go to operating the existing system and maintaining the capital and buses that we have. The other big pieces are operating of the current transitway system and the maintenance of the current transitway system, which comes in at 15% um, of the total. So even though we're growing the system, the large expenditures are still taking place on the system that exists today, operating and maintaining that system. And then the expansion transit ways, they're not small, and they will total uh, almost 20% of the total regional transit funds into the future. The final piece of this, the very bottom line, is you will see that when you account for what we're planning to do with expansion of the system and how we need to maintain and operate the existing system, due to the regional sales tax, we have about 3% of the funds, or 1.5 billion over the 26 year period, remaining unallocated. They have to go for transit purposes, but we have not yet identified the specific purposes that those funds will be used for, and that is a conversation that continues to need to have to take place between the regional transit providers, counties and cities, and TAB would have a role in that too. I believe I covered all these takeaways as I was going through that last slide. So I will pause there for any specific questions on how we fund transit within the region. Yes, Member Foster. Thank you. I have a, so the funding for Metro Mobility will come from the State General Fund. Mm -hmm. Right. What's how would we if, if we wanted to expand metro mobility coverage and service? What like how would we do that? What would that look like, um, Mr. Chair and members? The service area for metro mobility is already specified in state law. Okay. And so the coverage time can vary, and I, I'd probably look for Charles if you want any more information on that. Uh, so one piece would be if additional cities were to come into the Metro Mobility system, the state law would need to add them in. And uh, the way the funding will work is we will actually estimate Metro Mobility ridership looking and costs looking forward. We will work with the state and to get general fund appropriations that are based on those estimates. And then over time, we kind of reiterate that and check that the estimates, estimates are on or if the appropriation needs to be adjusted. Mr. Chair, did you want to add to that? Yes, Can I just, I, Lakeville struggled with this for a long time being part of the taxing district. Um, there's also a federal rule that if there is a, regular route bus service, then you have to, and it expands into new territory, then you also have to expand the footprint of Metro Mobility as well. So um, there's a couple ways, legislation, but if you see expanded fixed routes, then the federal government comes in and says, you have to have the accessibility component yeah. as well. Wasn't that a blue ribbon recommendation? And I apologize, I missed this slide for transit. So this slide, we talked about how transit is funded in total through all revenues. And what this slide is doing is really taking out just the regional sales tax revenues and identifying how those revenues are specifically being used. And as I mentioned, without these revenues, we would have been facing a very significant operating and capital deficit. Yeah. So as you see, 30% of the revenues are going to bus operations and 12% are going to bus capital asset management. Uh, and th that represent what would have been shortfalls or deficits for the system without this funding source. The other big piece in here is 25% of the revenues are going to what was previously the county share of transitway operations 
some of which 13% is for existing and 12 in the future, what counties would have been paying for the planned transit ways. So 25% of the new revenues are due to that shift in responsibility and the operations of dedicated transit ways. And then as I mentioned, 8% of the revenues or 1.5 billion remain to be allocated across other purposes. <coughs> Member Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. About the 1.5 billion unallocated, what, like, what's the process to allocate that? I mean, I know what you like. I said like Tab will be involved in that, but what's the, where are the moments to do that? And couple, couple responses to that. So the council is starting a process, working with the other regional transit providers at the moment, and talking about their view and vision for how these funds will be allocated. I think that's really the first step in the process is to figure out the allocation among transit providers and then have each transit provider have a process if they have excess funds for determining how those would, would be spent. So it might look a little different depending on which transit provider we're talking about. Um, that step will be occurring over this fall and incorporated into the 2025 calendar year budgets. And I think following that activity, we, we being the Met Council would come back and indicate what is remaining and what decisions might need to be made about the funds that came into the council's transit budget. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, Commissioner. To this point, given that this is a regional sales tax and goes far beyond the transit taxing district, why wouldn't you be having conversations at the onset beyond current providers and looking at opportunities to use some of this money in the unserved or underserved areas in the perimeters of the metropolitan area? Uh, Mr. Chair and um, Member Holberg, I think we will. I think the conversation, though, uh, the assumption is that a little bit that if there's an underserved, a non-served area at the moment, that that probably would be part of the Metro Transit, Metro Council, Metro Transit conversation as to what the needs are. There might be other areas where a suburban transit provider would expand into new territory too, particularly with micro transit services, but each provider will be leading a discussion about the types of needs that they would be addressing and where they would be expansion opportunities. So it, it may be outside of their existing service area. And it, if I might yeah. caution you, from the community that I represent, you cannot make assumptions about con cities contiguous to certain providers, whether they want to be part of that system or not, i.e. Lakeville, that's with Metro Transit, albeit the whole northern region is with Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. So I mean, I hope that when you have this conversation, you go directly to those communities, not the service providers on the perimeter, because they'll have really good idea. I mean, if somebody goes to Hastings, they're going to have a really good idea of what Hastings needs, as opposed to who could service them. <laughs> yeah, I think Charles Carlson has a add-on here. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, I, I think we ha we are beginning some of those conversations. MTS also manages the Transit Link program, and uh, as one example, we're in discussion with Scott and Carver County about expansions uh, of um, you know weekly circulator route between Norwood Young America and Waconia, as an example. They are also separately in conversation with Southwest Transit about expanding. Prime, their Southwest Prime service into Waconia as well, and then uh, beginning conversations about how we might fund that, likely in partnership where the council would be funding 50% from its transit uh, sales tax, the county from its transit portion of its sales tax, and certainly these conversations are, are things in the outlying area uh, we're happy to have with any county uh, in the region. Member Foster, then Member Barber. Thank you. We don't always agree on transit policy and everything, 
but there's so much opportunity in 1.5 billion on allocated dollars and how we're gonna think about our transit system. Like, this is a place to, I think, re really address the question of like geographic balance means like some places okay. won't get transit because they don't need it, but like, however we're going to engage, I don't know if it's creating new providers, I don't know if it's like just getting into the uncomfortable questions with county leadership, if it's constituents, but there's so much energy around that. So I would just say, however we're gonna spend this money, go big, or we should, like, we should just stop. Never Barbara. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will say, appreciate this conversation um, because this is part of what we were talking about. The first part we had to do was figure out all the requirements, what we needed to spend money on, what, how we're going to maintain the current system, and all of that. Um, it's very, very um, critical that we have this next step because it is a regional sales tax. So this is, you know, this is what um, we've been working on quite a bit to try and figure out what does that look like for the areas that are outside the transit taxing district because there are needs, like the project Charles talks about this, Norwood Young America <coughs> uses it as an example often because it's a food desert. And the, their biggest store in town is a quick trip. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so this circulator that they're looking at putting in place is so people can go you know, get groceries. So, I mean, it's a really good project. Um, as far as like the uh, suburban transit providers, uh, we worked really hard to get them an allocation for this year because we wanted, didn't want to sit and wait while we're trying to figure out plans. Um, this initial cycle was based off of their current ridership and that was how we allocated funds, but we started a series of meetings with each of the providers to start talking about um, how, what amount of the sales tax and how does it fit in. And I think part of this is, Yes, 1.5 million is a lot, but that's over 25 years. So, it, you know, if you start spreading it out in the increments of what's available for each provider, you know, we've got to make sure that we're keeping our fiscal responsibility for the entire region in balance. So, um, but yeah, all those conversations are being taking place over the next few months, and you know, hopefully, we come up with something that at least somewhat makes most people happy. So, I know we won't make everyone happy, but we're going to try. <laughs> okay, folks. Um, boy, you've been. Uh... Steady today. We've been here since noon, and we usually try to get out of here at 2.30. We've got two topics left to cover. I'm wondering if we should just hold those over. Local government revenue changes or regionally and regionally allocated funds categories. Um, I think people are getting kind of worn out, and we've had a, we've lost about a fourth of our tab. So if people are comfortable, we'll to be continued yeah. on those last two topics, Absolutely. and we'll give uh, Amy a breather too here. Yeah, sure. All right. Thanks. All right. And does anybody have any uh, anything they want to cover quickly? Depart. I, I would I would just like to say thank you for aiming for the deep dive. This is all valuable stuff, and I look forward to yeah. seeing the rest of it yeah. when you get back. It was a significant amount of work, and we uh, we are greatly appreciative of it. Folks, just to, kind of on a fun note, uh, quickly, uh, you know that pedestrian bridge we have uh, that goes over the Crosstown, yeah. uh, right by um, the park west of the South Hill Hospital? Yeah. It's been hit twice by trucks, yep. Yep. so it, and it's non-ADA compliant, so we've got funding to put a new bridge in place there. So the engineers uh, and the structural engineers have come up with a good idea about how to make it ADA compliant, and it, it functions well, but the form of it is really bad. So I, I just was sitting in a meeting and I, I Googled 10 most beautiful pedestrian bridges in the world and cold emailed two uh, architectural firms in the Netherlands, <laughs> no. uh, one in Chicago and one in Calgary. Oh, and I got uh, responses back from all of them. And so now we're on to this whole uh, form issue with, uh, particularly that you made me think about it, Brian, with the, the Netherlands, uh, that, I mean, if there's a place that knows how to deal with uh, Bike pen. Yeah, Cal do. Calgary too, though, is yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so anyway, uh, stay tuned yeah. on that. Maybe we'll come up yeah. with an interesting looking bridge for the budget. I don't know. We'll see. That'll be nice. So. Looking forward to it. I do know when that's been hit. Uh, we stand adjourned. Thanks, sir.